Mary Beth. Okay, motion to reconvene. Second. A motion is second to reconvene. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Tonight, um, item number two of the public forum, we have a number of people that have asked to speak. The public forum is to is um, people speaking have five minutes. The duration of the public forum is not to exceed 15 minutes. So, uh, as they came in to the clerk, I'm going to um, I'm going to read the names as, in the order that they came in. I have them from the clerk, and the ones that um, I don't. We have three, four, five, six people that want to speak. I've asked the the clerk to uh, let me know when 15 minutes is up. So if you uh, are a few words tonight, you'll afford somebody else an opportunity to speak. Okay? That's all fairness. We, um, we're gonna speak as we receive them tonight. Okay. So, item number two. Pursuant to rule 25 of the rules of the council, citizens may address the town on one subject only. Said subject of substantive town business, neither discussed during the regular meeting, nor related to personnel or job performance. Citizens may speak for no longer than five minutes and must submit a public participation form to the council clerk prior to the start of the meeting. All items discussed during this session will not be voted upon. Okay. Madam Clerk, you ready? Greg Hewitt. Greg? <coughs> Greg Hewitt, 25 Olives Way, Middletown. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to update you on the, the council on the status of the work that the Citizens Exploring School Unification, CESU, has completed to date. We have knocked on a lot of doors and we have talked to a lot of Middletown citizens. We have monitored the editorials in the local newspapers and web pages. We have easy, easily collected over a thousand signatures, or nearly a thousand signatures, that have agreed with the following statement. We, the undersigned, respectfully ask the Middletown Town Council to reconsider its decision and authorize comprehensive, non-binding discussions of school unification. We have worked with the citizens in the community to bring two forums of school, to discuss school unification issues to CCRI, which were very informative and well attended. These two forums brought experts from the state and regional high schools discussed regionalization, the curriculum, and related issues. What was found that the vast majority of Middletown citizens are angry that this council refused to even discuss the issue, and many think this council failed the citizens of this community. I would ask each of you to go visit our website, cesu.news to view the two videos of the forums that were presented so you can first become more informed of the issues and second, come to realize that this issue is not going to die just because five of seven counselors think that they know more than the experts and, that the, and the desires of many of the uh, Middletown citizens in this community. These forums will continue to educate our citizens and we hope the five counselors who voted no will reconsider their votes. This is an issue that has a decades long impact on this community and is a slap in the face of every citizen in this community to not go forward with the discussions. Thank you. Okay, Lorraine Starr, Lorraine. Hello, Lorraine Starr, 17 Holden Street, Worcester, Massachusetts and summer resident of Middletown. Um, Myself and my family have been coming to the beaches here in um, Middletown, predominantly Second Beach for 55 years, and I've been a summer resident for 15 years. I've observed and I'm a keen observer of what's been occurring with the dog issues on the beach. And I've tried to work with the last three dog offices and, um, and some council members, et cetera. 
So the, the biggest problem is the inability to enforce the dogs loose on the beach and the dogs pooing on the beach, children playing in the sand and the <coughs> poo going into the water. Our new chief and the new dog officer did a noble job this past summer, but it was still out of control. I am recommending um, a review committee, maybe some counselors, a resident who has a dog, a resident who does not have a dog. I'd be willing to be part of it, and I would highly recommend your employee who is the beach manager who is on the beach every morning at 7 o'clock and observes what's going on. Um, let's see. The dog allows dogs only on the beach in the morning, and we see dogs in the afternoon, predominantly in the late afternoon. There have been a lot of pit bulls running loose. People run with them in September when the kite surfers are there. Uh, they're respectful of the beach, but they do bring their dogs, and they leave them on the beach loose, and they kite surf. Um, those are a few observations. Um, we don't have enough police officers in the evening. The dog officer is off at 4 o'clock, 5 o'clock, and the dogs tend to come on the beach as soon as the lifeguards go off. I've worked with Will, and I've worked with, a few, uh, with the beach managers. I've requested a PA system in the morning that they mentioned 7.30 in the morning that the dog should be off the beach in 15 minutes. Um, I've asked also that they do, and somebody said you can do repetitive PA system um, announcements in the evening that dogs are not allowed. There was talk last summer that they would put at um, the entrances to the paths that the dogs are not allowed on the beach in the evening. Um, that did not occur, but it's still a possibility. I would recommend if you don't review it or you do review it and if you still want residents, and I know that that would be a serious issue for residents, that they feel that they're entitled or perhaps they are entitled to walk their dogs on the beach, that only Middletown residents can bring their dogs to the beach and adhere to the ordinance, which is to leash the dogs, take away the poo, and only the hours that are allocated and that they would register at the town hall, perhaps, and that they would show that they have shots and they would show that they have insurance to protect the town, and that they would actually sign a paper that says, I will obey the ordinance. So other people, they don't allow dogs on many other beaches in Rhode Island. For example, right in Newport, you cannot walk your dog on the beach during the high season it's off and I've known that the dog officer has told me in the past that often the police tell them off the beach but you can go walk them on Middletown Beach so maybe you can have a liaison with them and say that don't do that I don't know um, I'm looking for a solution and I'm saying maybe what are some of the possibilities for this solution that it's, it's an unsafe situation. I mean, the poo is awful on the beach. Some people pick it up. There are many respectful people. When I worked with Joe, who was the dog officer about three years ago, he told me most of the people who bring dogs on the beach and that he's given tickets to, three-fourths of it are Newport, Portsmouth, East Providence, Tiverton not particularly Middletown people. They know the ordinance. Um, I would request that you perhaps consider changing the ordinance, as many other beaches in Rhode Island have, just during the summer. Or, as I said, consider allowing Middletown residents to um, walk their dogs leashed. And Thank you, Lorraine. Huh? Time's up. Uh, it is. It is. I, I came Thank you, Lorraine. Time's up. I came two hours. We have other people that would like to try to get a word in. Okay. Charlotte Brown. Charlotte, come on up. It's the red light. It's the red light that says when you run out of time. I didn't see that yet. Good evening. I'm Charlotte Brown. This is my first time here with my story and it ties in with the dogs, the cats, the birds. 
Um, I live down the street on Continental Drive, and um, I have a barking dog situation for um, more, ni more years than I can count, as many people in this room have that situation too. I've tried different things. I have not wanted to have trouble with my neighbor, and uh, so I've tolerated his dog. <laughs> Um, and, uh, but I have my limits too, and I, I, I'm just there, pretty close to it. And, um, and this year, I don't remember when, six, eight months ago, my son decided to gift me with a bird feeder and bags of bird seed, puts the feeder up, puts the seed in jars, and here, Mom, you can sit and look at the birds. Wonderful, I love birds. Who doesn't love birds? So along with the birds have joined the party a couple of cats. And they come there, they have their times in my yard, and they stand watch over the birds, and the birds are at their mercy. So that's just my little story, and it's not taken five minutes or three minutes. And it doesn't surprise anybody in this room. My story is an original. It's original to me. And um, we have a problem in Middletown. We have a wonderful, wonderful community. And those things really, really affect neighborhoods and people that live in them. So I'm just here to tell you that and to say what's on my mind. And I want to thank you for your, all your efforts. I know you put a lot of effort into having things run smoothly, and having things go well for us. I've seen personal uh, response from my phone calls, and I'm very pleased with that. So I want to thank you. I want to thank the members. I want to thank you, and I want to thank everybody that's here tonight, interested enough to come out on this cold night and see what we're about. Thank you. Thank you, you Charlotte. Thank, thank you. you. Madam Clerk, what do we have for time? <coughs> Ten, we have five minutes. Lawrence Frank. Lawrence. Lawrence Frank, 8 O'Donnell Road, Middletown. I lived in a small town in Iowa for a number of years. Across the street from my house was a large Victorian wraparound porch with rocking chairs. Three generations, parents, grandparents, and children lived there. They provided a support system that adapted to the needs of each person. It had probably been that way for many years. That was almost 50 years ago. Middletown is grappling with a housing crisis. Senior housing is one part of that. A recent article in the Wall Street Journal, which I have provided to you, speaks to the changing preferences of older citizens. Many would prefer to continue to live in their homes, being close to those of all ages, and those who prefer to live in a dedicated housing want it so that seniors can live next to families and younger sing single people. Mixed-use developments will provide this. It is important that senior housing in Middletown not be isolated by age or geography. Where it is located is as important as the accommodations themselves. It is important to get this right the first time. Looking out, for, out the next 20 or 30 years towards a future where longevity and the elderly population increase. Gone are the days of multi-generational families living in the same house or even in the same state. The task of Middletown is providing, the task of Middletown is providing housing that offers community support through diversify, diversified housing housing that replaces that Iowa's family's experience of so many years ago. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Clerk. Mr. Viveris, you have three and a half minutes. Thank you, Mr. President, members of the council. During the debate of the new, new proposed tax system, it was stated that it would shift the tax burden from the wealthy to the not so wealthy. How can this be when all property increases 2%? So property assessed at $300,000, paying $4,128 in taxes, increases $6,000, 
and is now paying $4,210, an increase of $82. Property assessed at $1.2 million, paying $165,120, increases $24,000, now paying $168,422, an increase of $3,322. $3,302. Yet a Homestead Act was proposed and will be again that would reward property owners who qualify for the program by lowering their assessment by 7.5% while increasing the tax burden on businesses who will pass it on to their customers and residential property owners who did not qualify. Isn't that shifting the tax burden from those who qualify to businesses and those residents who do not qualify? It was also suggested that people who do not live in Middletown year-round should pay higher taxes. Yet, last year, Council Lombardi argued to waive the five-year waiting requirement for new residents when a gentleman who lived in Middletown and continued paying property taxes here and that prop on that property while owning property and living in and collecting benefits in Florida now wants to charge others who do the same thing. It was also said that young people would not be able to afford to buy property here under the new tax plan. Yet, under the present tax plan, Council Von Villa stated that she had to help her son to buy a house in Middletown. One must wonder if after three or four revaluations, if her son will still be able to pay his property taxes, especially if someone builds a million dollar house next to him. Isn't that ironic? that what the new tax proposal was accused of causing is happening under the present tax system. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Veras. Okay. I'm gonna make a motion that we move item number 19 up to next on the docket. Go ahead, second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Item number 19. Memorandum of the town administrator with enclosures RE, request to build pickleball courts at Linden Park. Motion to receive said memorandum. Second. Motion to second to receive. All in favor? Aye. Aye. President. Council Lombardi. I'd like to move that we uh, continue this um, to the December uh, 16th meeting. Um, the reason for this is that the group that's proposing this has a presentation they'd like to put before the council. Um, they were not prepared to do that tonight. I think in all fairness to them, um, we should afford them that opportunity. Uh, so, again, I'd like to move this to the December 16th meeting um, for the council. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm not opposed to that, but why wouldn't we just forward it to the open space and fields if they haven't seen it yet? I have no opposition to that. I mean, I, I just, we it, could do it's that. Gonna, it's going to go to them, it's going to go back to them anyway. You could do that on the 16th, too. I mean, I guess you're right. That, if you want to prolong it, that's fine. I mean, Either way, it's up to you. I agree with you that it should go to open space and fields. Okay, we don't have a motion either way, so we want to want to make a motion. I make a motion that we move it to the December sixteenth meeting. Do I have a second? Hearing none. You want to make another motion about the open space? I just, I just, unless Rick, you want to make it. I mean, it's up to you. you Can know. amend the motion. What's that? I mean, the motion that we. The motion didn't. It, it went no place. Right. There was no second. I make okay. Council Von Bills. Well, I was just going to say that if they, if they come here and make a presentation and then it gets recommended to go to, to um, the other subcommittee um, and then it's got to come back here again, that's three times. But if right. it goes first to the subcommittee, right. Right. I agree. Here, it's right. Mr. I agree. Great. Mr. President? So Council Flynn. In, in defense or <clears throat> recognition of Council Lombardi's um, position, I think before we send it to the subcommittee, the presentation may allow us to give some additional direction to the okay. subcommittee so they're not wasting time and do it at the preferences of the council. So maybe you know, putting it, seeing it first is <coughs> warranted on the 16th and then we can direct the subcommittee as we see fit. Okay. No. I'm, not well, I'm not inclined to do that. No. Okay. No, I'm inclined to just. Uh, okay. I mean, I, I think that kind of puts us in a pickle. Yeah. yeah it does. Oh, <laughs> nice. Okay. I'll make the motion. All right. Make the motion. I'll make. I'll make a motion that we uh, we forward this to the Open Space Fields Committee for their recommendation, and they can bring it back to us. Second. Any further conversation? 
Hearing none. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, thank you, Councilman Body. Okay, item number three, presentation. Memorandum of the Middletown Pre Prevention Coalition Director, R.E. Islanders Committed, Lunch and Learn Series, spotlighted at state conference. Motion to receive said memorandum and begin said presentation. Do we have a second, Councilor Santos? Second. Do we have a second? Second, yes, okay. I'm sorry. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Good evening, thank you for letting us speak before you. My name is Jake Cathers. I'm the chair of the Middletown Prevention Coalition. Uh, I'm here to introduce some members of our Islanders Committed group at the high school who want to share some of our recent successes in programming. So, thank you all for being here. Thank you. Hi, I'm Rachel and this is Ethan. We're both sophomores at MHS. We're here to talk about our Lunch and Learn series, which was spotlighted at the Rhode Island Healthy Schools Conference. I'm going to ask you just to lean the mic towards you or speak a little bit louder. Thank you. <laughs> So we're going to talk about our Lunch and Learn series that was spotlighted at the Rhode Island Healthy Schools Conference. And we're also going to be talking about some other events such as our Family Day and some of our kickoff assemblies. So we have a slideshow which will provide some imagery for this. Before the beginning of the school year, we were invited to present our Lunch and Learn program in front of over 400 attendees at the Rhode Island Healthy Schools Coalition Conference in Warwick. At the conference, we provide a brief summary of our program and its success. It has also been spotlighted on Channel 10's Health Check Kids by Barbara Moore Silva. <coughs> Following the conference, people came up to us and showed an interest in making similar programs to our Lunch and Learn. This was an exciting experience for me because I got to put my I got to test my abilities of public speaking in front of a very large crowd, and it also gave me the opportunity to show all of the hard work that we have done. Here are a few topics from our Lunch and Learn program. They were a very big success. We had entire classrooms come in and listen to our um, speakers. We had topics such on relationships, um, nutrition, sleep, as well as yoga, that was probably by far our most successful one. There is our yoga session. So this one was the nutrition session. So this was the 11th annual Middletown Family Day, which is a day that celebrates the importance of family connections and the impact that parents can have on kids. Um, strong and healthy family relationships can prevent future drug use in adolescence. Um, a healthy family relationship will give kids better judgment, um, resilience, and they will have more self-control. The Family Day is a huge event and was very successful. There was over 700 attendees this year. There was rock climbing, games, a sandcastle competition, airbrush tattoos, s'mores, and lots of great food trucks. Um, I personally really like the sandcastle competition because it's something that an entire family can enjoy and strengthens family bonds. And we would also like to thank you guys for paying for the band. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, here are a few sand castles. So as summer came to an end, um, we, quick, we quickly realized that school was coming around the corner way sooner than we anticipated. Um, but in September, we sponsored a kickoff assembly um, to help our peers start off the year on a positive note for everyone. This year and the previous year, we had Matt and Phil presentations talk about kindness, compassion, respect, and motivation. Here, the, they'll show up eventually. <laughs> this was the um, airbrush tattoo lady. She was a big hit. Right. 
There they are. There's Madville. Hmm. Okay. So these assemblies were very well received. The kids enjoyed their hard work and they gladly interacted with them and each other. They had us do these activities where we all stood up, um, talked to our friends and other peers that we don't usually talk to. We would give them compliments. Um, Matt and Phil, they also talked about what it means to be an everyday hero, um, the importance of being one. It can be anyone and the effect it has on those around them. They would also have students come up and speak. I remember seeing them for the first time. They were unlike any other guest speaker I've ever seen before. They were a lot of fun for everyone. We're looking forward to this year because we are in the process of planning several fun events for the students. Um, we plan on planning field trips, open Y nights, movie nights at both the high school and the YMCA. We want to do a health and wellness competition and we also plan on doing something new with the upcoming Project Purple Week in February. With, the f with events more directed towards the student body, we believe that we will have more recruits with us. And this year, we also want to take a leap and have re recruit kids in the middle school. So starting off young, they can go into a streamline where they make healthier decisions and live better lives. Islanders Committed is passionate about the improvement, health, education, of our generation and generations to come at Milltown High School. Our goal is to reshape Milltown into a happier, healthier, more welcoming, and a better informed community. Thank you for the support that you have shown Islanders Committed over the years, and we look forward to the years coming. And again, if it hadn't been free for each and every one of you, we would not be where we are today, and we thank you greatly for that. You're welcome, and great job on your great part, job. Cecilia. Great, great job, great job. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay, motion to act as a Board of License Commission. Second. Motion to second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Item number four. Application of the Royal Plaza LLC DBA Portofino Bar and Grill, 425 East Main Road, holder of a Class BT alcohol beverage license to transfer said 2019-2020 license to Middletown Tenant LLC DBA Portofino Bar and Grill for use of the same purpose. Okay, motion to receive said application and advertise for public hearing to be held on December 2nd, 2019. Second, and okay. a question. Go ahead, Council. I'd like to know who signed this application. That's a signature? All right, <laughs> I would appreciate from now on any application when someone signs their name, please print underneath their name. Okay, thank you. Great point, Council Santos. We have a motion second. Any further conversation? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion to reconvene as a town council. Second. We have a motion second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, motion to approve the consent calendar minus number seven. Second. Motion second to approve the consent calendar minus item number seven. All in favor? Aye. 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 Item number seven. <coughs> Memorandum of the Town Administrator with Enclosures, National Fitness Campaign Grant for Fitness Court. Okay, motion to receive said memorandum. Second. Motion to second to receive. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Vice President. Sean, can you just explain what's going on here? Because I read it. I mean, I get it. I just, I'm not, I'm not sure if there's location or this is just it's, some. It's really just. Okay, so if we approve the consent calendar tonight without pulling this off, what would happen? Nothing. Nothing? Okay. Nothing. Application is 
Sprint Spectrum LP DBA Sprint number 8492, 1364 West Main Road. Suite B for a holiday sales license for the 2019-2020 licensing year. This is new. Motion to grant said license. Second. A motion to second to grant. Any further conversation? Hearing none. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Item number 10. We have several people that want to mm. speak in regards to this. Memorandum of the town planner through town administrator with enclosures. Public hearing 2020. RIDEM Recreation Development Grant. Motion to receive said memorandum. Second. Motion to second to receive. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, motion to open the public hearing. Second. Motion to second to open the public hearing. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, some of you handed in paperwork, but this is your opportunity if you want to go up to the mic and speak. We have uh, Mr. Viveris, Sean Johnson, and Judith Kelly. You all put paperwork in the talk? Okay. Thank you, Mr. President, members of the council. Uh, my concern is the, uh, the third beach boat ramp. This came before the council when I was on in 2011, and the beach committee had received a grant of four, $400,000, which we had to put up 20%, okay, or $80,000. Problem was that if we accepted the money, we cannot charge non-residents more than twice what we charge residents. Right now, we do charge out of towners for parking, from what I understand. So, if we do this, then we, we can't, won't be able to charge out of towners unless we charge residents. And the Third Beach is the only place residents and taxpayers can go for, without paying a fee. And my concern is, if we accept the money, are we going to fall into that category? Second Beach is, falls in, into that category. That's why we can only charge, we have to charge residents. And my concern is that we're going to wind up charging residents because that's the reason why it was rejected in 2011. Mr. Solicitor, is that a fair statement? No. 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 Okay. No. Okay. Why don't you comment? It's just for the for the free lot. It's not Mr. for the Solicitor. Lot. Yeah. So this is for this is for the free lot that we, is limited to Middletown residents. So we're not opening unless you're somehow. Op First of all, I'm not aware that there would be anything connected with this grant application that would make that a requirement. Number two, that lot is only open to town residents. So uh, I don't believe there's anything in this grant application and the administrator can, can correct me if I'm incorrect that would require us to open that lot to non-residents. Okay. It, so. it, 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 it says this project proposes uh, the construction of a dock to serve boaters utilizing the third beach boat ramp. Estimated project is $100,000. The grant we're is already, We're already charging for that lot where the boat ramp is located. Well, we charge, so that the so, so the third, the third beach, okay, not, not the town beach lot, this, this boat ramp would be accessed via the third beach where the existing boat that's ramp correct. is. That's correct. Right. Correct. So, it, we're not so this project's not to construct a boat ramp. It's to cons basically install a floating pier. We're not building a boat ramp. Um, this is a, a seasonal uh, pier that was identified <coughs> by the town council subcommittee, which would be put in place during the spring. It would be anchored with uh, a helix anchoring system. It's like uh, rubber bands that, mount, uh, that mounted to the bottom of the, uh, the, uh, the water in the harbor um, and would hold the, pier, the, uh, the floating uh, dock space or not dock, but the, 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 the piers in place as they're extended out. Much different from the project that Mr. Rivera's is, is comparing this to, uh, which was the total demolition of the boat ramp, and then I mean, the construction of the new boat ramp that was extended out of right. the ocean. So, um, really, apples and oranges at this point. Does that clarify that, Mr. Rivera? And any anyone anyone can can use be able to use it without charge, right. whether they're residents or not. Right. It was the, the use of. The, the, Sean, the floating pier. could you speak into the yeah. mic, please? Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, Is this better? Uh, yeah. So this is a, there we go. again, a, a floating pier. Anybody would be able to use it. Um, 
for the purposes of launching and retrieving their boats. That's, mm -hmm. that's the purpose of the pier. Um, it's not a swimming pier, it's not a diving pier. Um, the complaint, and I think the committee heard this, we've heard it over the years, is that you launch your boat, you have nowhere to put it while you uh, park your car or as you get your car if you're trying to retrieve it. So um, it's providing that, that temporary dock space, it's providing the ability to, to load or offload your boat. Um, but that's that's the purpose of it, and it it would be free for residents and non-residents. And, and so it will only cost the town twenty thousand dollars, and that will come out of the uh, recreation fund. Uh, it's actually in the current budget. It was being funded out of the capital replenishment fund, uh, which is part of the beach fund. But it is a restricted funding source the council set up for capital projects like this. Thank you. Thank you, Sean Johnson. Sean. Yes, hi, Sean Johnson, 71 Wyatt Road. My, uh, my aunt's here as well. She's right up after me, but we have this similar topic that we'd like to talk about. So this is more about the, the lights and the concessions and everything going in at the former drive-in property. Uh -huh. So uh, we bo both border that land, and the initial intent when uh, years, years ago when this came about was to build one or two lacrosse fields on this property which we were very for. I think it's a great use of land. And it's, you know, I'd rather see that than to see some big store go up. We've heard about rumors for years what was gonna go in there. So lacrosse, lacrosse fields are fantastic. Um, our concern at the time was as long as there's no lights, because we already deal with the Gaudet lights now, which are probably on as we speak, whether or not there's anyone even on the field right now. So that was one of our initial concerns. And we talking with the, the lacrosse groups that wanted to go in there, they said, we don't even need lights. We don't want lights. We want a few fields to play on. So a few months back, my, my aunt and I went to see the plans. And not only are there lights, there's concessions. There's restrooms. There, it's becoming a complex. And looking at the plans, the concessions and restrooms, which maybe could have been built further closer to the Gaudet parking lot, are now on my property line. And about 100 yards from the concession and the restroom already at the Gaudet field. So I just, I feel at this point, is there a need for all of this? Or is this something that, hey, we can get this, let's just go out and get it, let's get more. And you know, I look up Wyatt Road at the soccer fields, no lights, a small concession area, no bathrooms, and hundreds and hundreds of kids play there every weekend weeknights, never an issue with it. And I just feel like this could be that too, great fields for kids to play on, sports. Do we need all of this extra? And it's, and especially the way the plans are now. I mean, I, I'll be smelling the fry later every day I'm out in my backyard from that concession stand. It's a stone's throw from where I am. And if we're gonna do this, all of this, why does it have to be right where it is now? Can it be further back? Do the lights have, can we have restrictions on the lights? I mean, I, I, how far down this process are we already? We've seen the plans and um, is, are there, is there room to talk about these plans, discuss these plans? Because it's, it, it's almost forcing the, the locals out of this area. It's, it's becoming not a great place to live. And I don't think that was the initial intention. The initial intention was to take land that was not being used and put in fields for kids to play. So. That's my concern, so thank you. Thank you, Sean. Thank you. And as a matter of point, it is still evolving, so. Great, thank okay. you. Judith Kelly, Judith. And again, I have no objections to the um, actual lacrosse fields, it's the lighting. I said, um, the people in our area, and I know we're a small neighborhood, but we don't even need yard lights at night. That middle school lights up everything. And I know it's on when there's no one up there. And I know the town did work on it. They were on all night when it first started. And um, the town did work on that so that it goes off at a certain time at night. But it's still, I can't see it growing down Aquidneck Avenue. And that's all I have. Thank you, Judith. Vice Thank President. You. So, uh, Sean, we had talked about on that committee, it was probably about four or five years ago now, um, the very first meeting, we brought up lights. Um, and they're not just lacrosse fields, they're going to be multi-purpose fields, um, probably flag football, um, those types. We didn't want to just restrict it 
to like the soccer fields. Um, we did a, I don't know, we did a, uh, a study. We took a bus ride, bus trip around town mm -hmm. to, for just baseball, um, lacrosse, um, football. We looked at all the sports because we didn't want to just focus on one. We wanted to kind of solve the, the field problem. So that's why we did this here and we did it with multi-purpose fields so that they can be used by other sports teams or other sports. Um, the process is still evolving. Um, uh, bathrooms we did talk about from the get-go, uh, but they sh I'm not quite sure. I can't remember where they're located. Um, they were, um, I thought, Sean, that they were down on towards Gorday more. Uh, because they, because, of the, the because of the sewer intent. line that was there, that flows down to Aquinnick Avenue, because we were going to tie into the sewer line there. The original plan had restrooms on on the south side of the property. They have moved north. I think Warren has a, a yeah. site map, which might be right. Helpful. And that we went over those plans. I think the initial they were further back, okay. near closer to Gaudet. Now they're. As close to Wyatt Road as you can get. Yeah, so one of the other things we were looking at with lights was it's going to be, to my knowledge, Sean, and please correct me if I'm wrong, it's a different type of, of lighting based mm -hmm. on the neighborhood and the concerns of the neighbors where they're not giant lights like the ones over at Gorday. And I, and and I, I get, I I get, I get your concern. Yeah. I, you I know, put a little gate in if, there, if I could smell that fry lighter, by the way. <laughs> I'd be right over there. I'm not sure. So. But anyway, well, um, I, I think my overreaching concern is yep. it's the lights. Now it's concessions. Now yep. it's rest. I felt like there, it's just building and building. Yeah. And um, you know, uh, again, the concessions and restrooms they're they're right at the football field. It's that's a hundred yards away, yeah. and it seems like it's just it's again. Do we need it? Uh -huh. Will it make it that much better? And you right. go to, again, the Wyatt soccer fields, they don't have restrooms, they don't have concession stand, they have a small shack, you know, and I've never heard complaints about that. Maybe they want lights there, I don't know, but it's, it's just, is it, it's need, and I don't, I don't want to say the word greed, but it almost feels like it's greed over need right now, so. Um, so, I just have one more. So Warren, where are the, um, where is this proposed concession stand? We have a plan that shows that right now the concession and the restrooms are located adjacent to the uh, baseball diamond. So they'd mm -hmm. be up in the northeast corner of the multipurpose fields. So I know they were originally the bathrooms are on the south end of the property. Why, did, why were they moved? We moved those so that we could tie in by gravity to Wyatt Road. It's half the distance. Uh, there's been some changes down on the Gorday property with the addition that would have forced the sewer line out into the parking area. Okay. So is there any proposed type of buffer uh, for Mr. Johnson and Mrs. Kelly and Ms. Ms. Weber? Yes. There's a double row of the giant western arborvitaes, 255 of them I believe is the number of these, these arborvitaes, mm -hmm. and also the the field is going to be filled now almost to the property line. We'll stop short of the property line and then slope back down to the property line. So the arborvitaes themselves are going to be four to five feet higher than the existing grade that's out there right now. How close is the, are, these, are these buildings, facilities to their property line? The distance, I don't know um, off the top of my head, I would estimate them to be somewhere about 70 feet or so. Because the lower field, if you look at the lower field number two, that's set 50 feet off of the property line. Mm -hmm. So if I just look and kind of gauge that distance, it's more than 50 feet. It looks like it might be twice that distance, but I don't want to, if I'm estimating, I'll say 70, 75 feet. Okay. So, Sean, one of the other things a part of the lights was the initial discussion was Pop Warner had came in because <clears throat> you know the little kids practice you know as, as daylight savings comes on the little kids and, and we lose daylight the, the little guys practice way in the back against the existing fence I'm sure you can hear them um, and there's very very limited lighting there so initially we wanted just a 
a, a light facing them as well. This pointing away from your property for, for safety reasons for them. So um, I don't know if that helps or not. Yeah, I, I guess, you know, for us, it, 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 will, will there be any time restrictions? Will there be certain mechanisms built in for that that would make it somewhat of a buffer? And again, you know, the, uh, to me, it's it's just it's grown so much. Like the restrooms and concessions is just another thing on top of it. So I get the lights. I understand that. Yeah. So one of the things when we when we there was a proposal for that big complex up on East Main Road mm -hmm. by by Campanaz Boulevard, and that, that got shot down because of the the cost and other other factors. And when we looked at the fields that we were looking at, um, and we looked at Gorday, we said, look, we we have something there already. So that's kind of why what we're doing there for the need for the lacrosse. And I get what you're saying about the lights, but Sean, maybe you could speak to the light and the light company a little bit about what we talked about with the low impact or um, sound. Some, there was something with the lights, right? Yeah, the, the, new, the new light systems are designed so that with the LED, the light is targeted down. It's more focused on the field. It doesn't drift off the field. Um, there were improvements made on the Gaudé field um, a number of years ago, but the, the new lighting truly is designed so that the light stays on the field and doesn't, doesn't bleed over. It, it has more of a dark sky compliant. There's an actual company, Sean, that mm -hmm. we, we hire, I think at the name of them, they'll come down and they'll design it so that it doesn't impact your property. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is there any move, uh, potential to move the restroom concession? I mean. That's going to be kind of cost driven. I, 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 I we can it doesn't even seem it. like the best spot for it, never mind my property. It's like the furthest point from everything there. I would think it would make more sense to put it closer to where the parking is. If so. it, it, the reason it was moved, according to our engineer, was because initially it was on the south side, mm -hmm. but otherwise it would be have to either well, one, we wouldn't have bathrooms down there, or um, have to put some type of pump facility in mm -hmm. to be able to pump it. Um. I think the other thing we looked at was providing at least a restroom facility for the baseball field. Mm -hmm. um, that, that was an issue also because you have the concentration of people up in that corner and there really isn't a place for someone to, to use a restroom. Is there, is there a possible way they can locate it another a little bit further away and still have gravity? I mean, you know, life's about concessions, right? Or compromises. So, mm -hmm. I think if I think if uh, oh concessions, yes. I just I, I did a pun and I didn't know it, Sean. You know, so. Oh boy. I guess I'm full of them tonight. Yes, you are. Pickled all, pickled up. Why don't I mean, we just, just take a look at that? Yeah. See if absolutely. you can yeah. do it. Okay, yeah. Council Santos. Mm -hmm. you want Thank to you. Say something? Yes, I'd like to ask Mr. Johnson a question. Uh, Turner's Road late, uh, early. Don't, don't let it fool you. I'm not either, just so you know. <laughs> Do the lights at Gorday ever get turned off? Yes, at some point. But there's, I, it, I don't feel like there's any rhyme or reason to it. I, 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 I've seen them on at 5 in the morning, very late at really? night. I, I, I don't, I, I, like the, I, if there's a time restriction, I don't know what it is. Is so. there anybody? Th there's, there's very often times where the entire field's lit up and there's not one person there. Okay, so. that's interesting. Yeah, yeah very but, often. But like I said, right now, that could be the case. Well, so. Yeah, but you just don't know who's going to show up and who's not. I think there's a certain time. Well, as long as I thought there was a switch at one point, but I don't know if like what the story is with that. Playing. No, no, people walk the track. It's not oh. just for sporting events. Right. Okay, Council and body. We've seen you out there. So, so there, I believe there's, isn't there a switch that you can turn on and it only lights up a certain number of lights so that it's people It's supposed can, to. Right. No, there is, there, there is in fact, I mean, I've used it. There's a button on the uh, near, there's the two concrete buildings. You hit the button, it stays on about 30 minutes. But it's only half the lights. It's not the whole. Two lights. Two lights. Right. Um, so that's, that's one question that I had. The other thing was when we, when I was on the committee with Paul and uh, Councilor Rivaris at the time, and um, one of the discussions that came up was the lights mm -hmm. and the effect on the neighbors. And I do remember uh, the discussion about the time restriction. It was, the, the main issue, as Paul said, was 
the youngsters playing later in the evening when it gets dark early mm -hmm. and the need for some more light. Mm -hmm. And I would be all in favor of a time restriction so that they're not on at all times. Right. And yeah, then, they shouldn't know, be. You know. Well, and, and again, it's a slippery slope. Then yeah. you know we'll have a tournament there, and the tournament needs to go until eleven o'clock at well, night. Well, no, I'm and, you know, that's yeah. So a hard, fast time restriction. I, it's good. They go off. They go off. They go back on again. Well, don't forget the other reason for the lights also showing safety. was well, safety, but mm -hmm. was because um, it allows us to have less fields because we can expand the time to playing on it mm -hmm. to a certain time for the different sports. It was, a scheduling, yeah, it was okay. a scheduling thing to help with more days, less daylight at times. That's all it was, more than anything else. Well, I, uh, it'd, I'd appreciate that having a time restriction on that, too. I'd be all for that. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you, Sean. Thank you. Thank you Council Flynn. Um, so, no, I, this is for you, Sean. Thank you. Um, so these are questions about this docket item, Can, uh, unless we're not done with the <coughs> multi-purpose fields. Okay. So, um, Mr. Brown, you're right. There are two different grants going uh, to be applied for under this docket item. Do I have that right? Correct. Okay. Because um, I got a, a bunch of emails and texts on the doc issue, and it was a little confusing because it was rolled into this one docket item called recreational development. So there, uh, there are two resolutions. So it isn't. While there's one memo, there's it's actually unbundled on the vote. So well, I understand that, but it was still a little confusing for people <laughs> who discovered it by accident. Um, so I just had a couple of a few number of questions that I had and that came forward. If uh, you could just clarify those up, um, and uh, you know, I think a lot of people uh, that are interested didn't really know this was on the docket tonight. Um, so on the dock drawings, um, there's a comment that says properties of St. George's School notation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can you explain that, please? St. George's owns the property. Oh, is that? Oh, well. hey. let's, let's try to maintain some order. Mm -hmm. Mr. President, if we're going to have this discussion, I'm going to recuse. Yeah. Okay, recuse. Madam Clerk, note that the Council of Lombardi recused himself. Mr. Braun, you want to answer that? Yes, St. George's owns uh, a portion of the property um, down down in the area of Third Beach, which includes the parking lot and also property adjacent to the boat ramp. Is this project going to impact any of that property, or is it just notification on the on that picture that this belonged to St. George's? No, we'll have to speak with St. George's um, about the project, and uh, ultimately we would have to indemnify them. Uh, similar to what we do on the parking lot. Which, which means what? You, there would be an arrangement or a... Con we, would, we would modify an existing agreement that we have with St. George's. Um, we would also seek a letter from St. George's just um, seeking their lack of opposition to the project um, at the boat ramp. Okay. So. And that has not been done yet? No. Okay. Um, I think a lot of the questions that I got sort of are, are like... Um, Mr. Johnson's about how far along is this? So um, I'm just going to down my list. So could you clarify? And I think you did earlier. This is a pier that also floats. It's not just a floating dock. It's a pier that also floats. Is that no? True? It it floats. It's it, it's not. There's there's a gangway component to get from the beach to the floating pier to the floating dock, and then basically the dock itself is is nothing more than a float. So the dock floats and the pier also floats. There is there's no pier portion, I believe, is there? Or there's no, no. there's no there's no there's no fixed Just pier. Just a dock. Just a dock. So there's there's a, a and I'll let Warren walk through it. There's a there's a gangway that gets you from the beach to the floating the floating docks, uh, but there is no fixed component at the end of the day. So um, at the end of the beach season, um, there really is nothing left on the the beach. Um, from an infrastructure standpoint. So maybe, maybe have Warren walk, just walk yeah, through it. Yeah, if you could it. describe, sure. you know, that's the questions I'm getting. What is this long uh, red outline? It looks like an L with a very short leg um, going out into the water that's, I think, measures 40 feet at the end leg. Warren, that, grab that mic. Does it come out? Yeah. Right here? Okay. Good, good. All right. 
So, orientating you to the drawing, here's the parking area. This would be a ramp that would extend from the parking area down to a float. So the float starts just above mean high water. <clears throat> from mean high water, it sits and rests on the beach during a low tide. When the tide comes in, you have a high tide, it's gonna get lifted up, it's gonna float. So this is an entirely floating system all the way out. And how long is that? Uh, this is 144 feet and this is 40 feet. So a portion, oh, that's awfully loud. A portion, a portion of it is gonna rest on the beach. During low tide, it'll be sitting on the sand. The tide comes in, that portion gets lifted up and it goes up with the tide. And that eliminates the need for a fixed pier or dock, the pilings and all of that. So there's no real, there's less impact to the, to the view, to the, to the scenic. 144 feet out and, and then a 40? A 40 foot L, L. that would provide a, an area for a boat to, to rest. Now that, that length is determined by two factors. One is the depth of water out there is three feet. That's what's required to float the, the harbor master's boat. And also this yellow line represents eelgrass, which is a federally protected submerged aquatic vegetation. Okay, um, let's see. So one of the questions uh, is if the, if the grant's applied for and awarded and then the council's then asked to accept this grant, is that how it works? Or once it's awarded, we get it? it I guess the question was, is there going to be another public hearing? What's the process? If we're awarded the grant, we would need to sign a contract. I would typically come back to the council and seek authority to sign the contract. So there wouldn't be another public hearing? There wouldn't be a public hearing, but there would be a docket item. Okay. Um, and at, so that docket item, yeah, my, my question is based in, you know, is there public support for this? Uh, as Mr. Vivero said, you know, a lot of the people have called me were around the last time this came in front of whatever council was here. And they were, they were stating their opposition and stated it in quantity and the <coughs> council got that message and, and opposed um, the, this, the structure. So, so just um, to correct, just to, to clarify again, Mr. Viveros was talking about demolishing the current boat ramp Constructing a new one? boat ramp and mm -hmm. constructing a fixed pier um, that would be extended out. Th this project is is not. It, it doesn't resemble that project in the sense that this is a temporary floating structure um, that is, you know, will be constructed or implemented adjacent to the existing boat ramp. They are they are different. Well, I think the the mass of, of what's being proposed is not all that different. I mean, it may not be, you know, on pilings, but I think that, um, you know, I was sent some, some quotes from the comprehensive plan and the goals. In the comprehensive plan, there's, there's no mention of pier or dock in relation to Third Beach. They talk about Green Lane Park, um, but nothing down at Third Beach. But the goals in the comp plan include one of them says, preserve the character of second and third beaches while supporting appropriate recreational uses and ensuring public safety. Another goal is preserve third beach by maintaining the current facilities and level of use. Um, and I guess adding something of that size, that's not a small thing. It, it sort of adds to the density and activity of what's gonna go on down at third beach. And that Third Beach really is one of the last serene, untouched areas in Middletown. And I'm not sure that that's what the public wants. I, I'm just not sure that there's enough awareness of this coming up again and support for it. Um, I did read the beach report that's coming up later in the docket. And I did note in the Harbor Master section on page six, um, he doesn't mention a pier, but he states simply, and if I could just read it, um, quote, we need a boat dock. If we had a boat dock, the ramp would be much safer. I, I assume that's the boat ramp that exists. I know there are restrictions set by CRMC on standard boat docks. We need the least expensive plastic Trex dock that meets state criteria. This dock should be mobile so it can be removed by axle or winched on a car tow truck and brought up into the parking lot. It does not have to be permanent. 
And I'm just, um, I received a couple of emails I'd like to also read um, excerpts from, from people who uh, were around the last time this was brought up and it said, and they say, one of them says, how did the town council permit this, this docket item? Over 100 citizens came to town hall a couple of years ago to show their opposition to building a pier at Third Beach. The comp plan makes it pretty clear that the town should protect the serenity of Third Beach. Does the planning board have the power to stop this? But before I go on, I'd be interested in seeing the plans. How would I get a copy? Will this require the okay of the CRMC? And I got a text that said, why would town council request a grant for a project until it has determined that there is public support for the project? The last time the public expressed its position on a dock slash pier, the opposition was overwhelming. Um, so I'm just not sure that we have public support for this kind of a bulky development on Third Beach at this particular time. I, I'm a, I'm, I was a little rattled by things coming in and comments from people who have been this, this way before. I think, I think the difference is, and what can possibly be a little confusing is that Mr. Brown is requesting that he can apply for this grant. Okay. Now, once he applies for it, and if it is approved, mm -hmm. then it comes back to us to accept it. There's a big difference, because this might be mute. We might apply for this and not get this grant. However, well noted what you've taken. Mr. Mr. Brown, are we going to be storing this if this should come to fruition? Are we going to be storing this in the parking lot down there? We'll have to store it somewhere. I, Any thoughts on that yet? Probably not at the parking lot, just, just because of the amount of vandalism that happens down there. Um, so I we're going to have to store this? Probably pull it up to Public Works. That would be my, my thought. but. Yeah. It would have to be stored off site. I don't think they'd allow it to store down there. Being the floodplain, if we had a hurricane or a storm event, it'd tend to float away. So they'd have yeah, it stored up, upland, yes. Just on a, on a different note, we have met with CRMC for a pre preliminary mm -hmm. determination on this project. Um, This is a, a preferred project because of its temporary nature for CRMC um, compared to a, a more permanent structure down in that area. Um, and there would be a public process in which, uh, as this project proceeds, our next step is to file an application for the project with CRMC. There would be a, a full meeting of the CRMC board to consider and uh, permit this, you know, a, as we go on. So and we could certainly come back again and uh, let the public you're going to have an opportunity on it. so there's going to be an opportunity for the public to weigh in with the CRMC board there would be an opportunity for the council to weigh in again when it considers whether or not to accept the grant and the council will have a third opportunity to weigh in <coughs> when the bid goes out and we get bid proposals to award the contract for the project so there are a number of approvals that happen before this is ever ever sees a boat yeah I'm kind of I'm kind of pleased with the it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a lengthy process. So if we get the grant, we're not tied to going no, forward No, absolutely not. Th that was the concern, absolutely I think, that I was hearing, no. um, that people no, weren't we're aware that this no, was not. coming up. No, we're not. Very good. Vice President. So the, the beach committee, beach subcommittee, um, we had, I don't know, seven, eight meetings that were publicly attended, and this was discussed there as well. There was absolutely no opposition to it. Um, I'm sure some people probably weren't aware of it. I don't know, this goes back a couple of years, but this is not the same scope or magnitude that was proposed in 2011. That was permanent. That was a, with pilings, everything. This is a safety issue. It, Third Beach isn't the same Third Beach when I went to Third Beach. There's a lot more people on Third Beach now than there was then. And there's a lot more boating activity, a lot more recreational activity. And you answered your own question when you talked about the comp plan. And as soon as you said safety, and I knew you were going to mm -hmm. say safety, that's why this was brought up and proposed. This is removable. Um, we want the least expensive, safest one that meets the state criteria. That was talked about 
three years ago? Does it mean it has to happen? No. Um, but it's not the same. The people that oppose that, I would never, I opposed it. I would never approve or support a permanent uh, um, dock or, or pier. That's more of a pier where you could pylons walk on permanent. Mm -hmm. This is like, this reminds me of when I was a kid, I used to swim out to the raft. It's like a floating structure. It's longer, obviously. Um, but I, I just see the safety and, you know, if the harbor master does that job, the same guy's been doing it for 20 years. I don't know, that's just, that's just me. I just want to make but sure there's public support, I, especially right, since understood. it has changed. I think that the education yep. is critical yep. and we want to make sure yeah, we I mean, do what the community wants. If you get a bunch of people wants. that say we don't want it, then we won't do it. But we had hearings and not one person okay. proposed it. Let's give the uh, people in the audience an opportunity to speak for a while. Uh, yep. Is there anybody else here that would like to make any comments tonight? This is an open public hearing. Yes, sir. Come on up. Name and address. My name is David Rushlow. Uh, I live uh, here in uh, Middletown. Uh, the only thing I can say is, again, uh, I wasn't really prepared. I heard about this about the last minute. My thing is, is that to put that pier on there, 100 feet and another 40 feet, if you, if you go down there, if you go down there all the time, it's a beautiful beach. It's not disturbed yet. We haven't had a chance to screw it up. So with this right here, this is not something, when we're down there, you really don't want to look out at that. And as for it being a, a safe thing for boating, I look at it and I have to say, it, it's not going to change anything. There's not a lot of traffic per se. I spend, I, I go down there at nine o'clock in the morning, my wife and I don't leave till five o'clock at night. Sometimes we go down there at night and walk around. It's not a big situation that you need a pier to back people up. If the pier is done like this anyhow, with those boats right there, if you have to get over to that ramp, there's not enough room if that thing bogs up with two boats or three boats out there. It's not gonna be easy pulling your boat in there and getting it to the ramp. So, so Dave, right now we have, and it's been going on for years, you know the pole, that big pole there? Right. People will tie their boats and then they'll go up if they're doing it by themselves and it's swaying back and forth, the boat, depending upon the, the, the mm. I mean, there's not a lot of current there. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, that's been going on for years as well. And so we're trying to, and people aren't, one of the, in the reports from the Harbor Master, <laughs> the, the biggest issue was people swimming in that area that shouldn't be, even though the other ones has the, uh, the buoys. Right. So, I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, it's just, I think it's it, a safety issue. I thought it's always been a safety issue, but it, we'll see what happens. And again, it's just, I hear what you're saying, <laughs> but it's just, it's a floating dock. It's not a pier. It's just, it, it's just floating. It, it's still an object in the, it's still an object in the water that it changes it. Mm -hmm. It does change it. It's not like it's 30 feet long or 20 feet long. It's 140 feet. Well, maybe it doesn't there. have to be that long. I don't, I don't know. Does it have to be that long? The, the length was set by the depth of water that's required to float the oh, harbor okay. masters. Okay. Boat. Yeah. No, that's, that's all I'm saying is I, I just like to keep the beach as pure as we can. We have other things that's going on at uh, surface end that's continuing right now with uh, what we have in the, in the filtration system, uh, that that's still, I think, an ongoing thing that I think still has a lot, a lot of uh, work has to be done on that. There's other parts. Let's, you know, let's not put more stuff where, let's keep Third Beach the way it is. It, it's a beautiful beach. Let's just keep, like I've always said to you people before, you can put stuff in, you can't go back, even though it's a floating dock. But it, it's, there's no reason for it to be there. It really isn't. I don't think so. That's just my opinion. I thank you for your time. But we have a, our beach is a special, and you just can't be doing all this stuff. You can't do it. Thanks, Dave. Council Thanks, Lombardi. Dave. Council Lombardi. So, <clears throat> like many of us here, um, I spend a lot of time on our beaches, Third Beach in particular, as my kids have grown up on that beach and you know they kind of migrated over to second beaches 
the waves got bigger and they wanted to do other things. But my wife and I still still go to Third Beach a lot. <clears throat> and it's a family beach, and I get it. But the other piece of this is when you sit there for hours, like we uh, in the summertime, um, you watch people launch their boats, and you watch them struggle to take things off, and get them into the dinghy, and bring it out to their mooring. Or, and we have moorings out there. We have a mooring field there that people pay good money. And they have no amenities whatsoever. This dock, in addition to uh, being a safety issue, uh, it allows them to come in off their boats, bring their dinghy in, unload their boat, go back to their cars. I mean, and I see them struggle with this. It's, it's, it's an amenity. I mean, we have a waiting list for moorings out there. And those people, like I say, they pay good money for that. And we should give them something. We give them nothing. And that boat ramp is not in the best shape to begin with. And it's the only boat ramp in Middletown right now. It's the only boat ramp. There's nothing on the west side of town right now. So I think at this point, whether it's fishermen, whether it's people who have moorings, um, you know, for our, for our harbor master to be able to tie up maybe in an emergency or to be able to bring a truck down so they can get the boat out of the water. Um, we've all seen that. We've all seen the harbor master ask, have people help them wait, wait here while I get the truck so I can, so I can load, get the boat and pull it out of the water or put it in the water for that matter. There are a lot of uses, safety and otherwise, why we should be considering this. Okay, just tonight, so everybody understands, we're not making the decision. These are grant applications for both the lighting and the buildup of the concession area, lacrosse fields, <coughs> multi-purpose fields, and also for the, the floating pier. Tonight is grant application night. I just don't wanna get lost in the forest here tonight and go off and everybody leave here tonight thinking it's done. Yes, sir, come on up. Name and address. At the mic, please. Hi, for those who don't know me, my name is Michael Zaram. Um, I am not a Middletown resident, although I wish I was. And now What is your address, Mike? Oh, excuse me? Where do you live? I live at um, Warwick, Rhode Island. Okay. Although I've spent summers in Middletown since I was eight years old. Um, including Third Beach. And um, I want to thank Ms. Santos. I met her the other night at the uh, Airport Corporation meeting. And um, I'm actually quite interested since it's on the agenda because I have used the beaches in Middletown since growing up when my aunt lived here. Um, and like a lot of people in this room, Third Beach is a very special place. And when I'm listening to people here, a lot of this is about balance, trying to keep things um, untouched and preserve um, what everybody sees when they go out there which is more natural versus adding structures and everything and at the same time there are safety issues involved and stuff like that so um, am I allowed to ask questions to I'm just curious what if this was more a safety issue I heard some other comments but um, if someone can tell you me can make I'm a little vision and pit exactly where it's going to go relative to the beach where the, um, the concrete ramp is that's there now Mr. Hall, could you, our engineer will point that out to you. <coughs> well, the existing concrete ramp. Okay. And again, there's no guarantee on this. I see. Tonight, excuse me, excuse me. Tonight is application night. I see for your it, grant. It isn't etch this in stone night. I see. Okay. And, this, and the, the grant is applications going to who? Rhode Island DEM. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. So they'll entertain letters of support I, I, if, if it's wanted. Okay. Um, other than that, my, my comments are one, it's a, it's a beautiful beach. And of course, we know there are both local residents that use it, as well as people from other parts of Rhode Island, as well as people from out of state. Um, I've also moored out there um, with boats for, for over 30 years and slept overnight out there, typically at the end of the year, bringing my friend's sailboat into Newport to dock. And I do know that the, there are safety issues. Um, I was kind of surprised this last summer when I saw the 
deteriorated condition of the concrete ramp was was pretty treacherous. And, and I've seen people struggle trying to get their boats in and out. And um, I think what you mentioned is valid about having something that's more stable for people to load and unload things off their vessel and try and keep things safe. And one of the other things I was concerned though is um, are there rules and regulations? Or have you talked about rules and regulations for usage of such a structure and things like that? And what's, is there a time limit? Is there a fee? Um, and things like that too. And if this went in as a floating dock, what would happen with the concrete ramp? Would that also stay there or would that come out? That would stay. There's no fees. And again, application tonight, this is application conversation. Okay. No, there's no guarantee we're even going to get it. I see. And, and did somebody propose this or was it just... It, was, it came the from a proposal from a beach commission, a beach commission. Oh, okay. All right, all right, all right. And then is it mostly going to be for, for larger vessels? What would happen with smaller paddling things like kayaks and stuff like that? I don't see why they couldn't utilize it. Okay, all right. Um, and looking at that, the only thing I see, too, is a little conflict where if somebody still wants to use the concrete ramp, that they boom, going right in with a see where the two vessels are and, and the like eleven o'clock position on there too. Just, just mention that. So, and the only other comment I have is um, I understand it's going to go through CRMC for approval and everything. Uh, I also just want to mention too, the Army Corps of Engineers may have jurisdiction in there too. I, I don't see something like this being a problem to get approved by the Army Corps of Engineers if they do have jurisdiction. But so, thank oh, you. Thank you. Council Santos. Just a few words. Mr. Lombardi brought up an issue about safety. Well, let's start at the beginning. The Harbor Master boat is brought down to Third Beach every single day during the season. It is stored at the Middletown Police Department. What was the Middletown Police Department is now Public Works. Correct me if I'm wrong. He picks it up in the morning and when he completes his tour of duty, if you want to call it that, he takes it back. By putting this floating dock, the boat will be permanently there. No. That's no. what the police chief told me today. Uh, I still believe that that's only for people to tie their boat up when, as Rick stated earlier, if they're by themselves, safety reasons, kayakers, it's but limited time. It's just in and out. It's, it's, it's just for a temporary. I know it's temporary, but if, if he's. It's not going to be stored there overnight, no. Well, somebody better talk to somebody. Okay, I rest my case. That's it. I'm done. Again, tonight is for the application. <laughs> you know? The application. Yeah. All right, anyone else? Yes. Name and address. Lorraine Star, 17 Holden Street, Worcester, Massachusetts. I'm considering buying in Middletown. I have and looked over the years. And um, I'm concerned about this. Not, I know it's only an application, but I think it's really important to say how many moorings are out there, what is the cost of the mooring, who does it serve, and what impact is it going to have on a family beach? People go there after work, they go there regularly. It just seems as though it's a big impact on the family structure and the beach and people eating there. Thank you. Anyone else? Mr. Viveris. Thank you, Mr. President, Member of the Council. Uh, I have, have a problem, one thing, in, in asking or applying for a grant and then deciding not to do the project and then turning the, the money back in. I also have a problem because the list of projects in this town is longer than my arm, yet we keep adding more and more and more projects. We have a project now that we estimate the, uh, what it's gonna cost, but we don't know where we're gonna get the money from. So I would caution to moving ahead with something where we don't have a, uh, 
we could take, take and spend money on some of these projects that have been delayed for several years that haven't been done. They keep moving back and back farther down the list. Um, I don't know, it took, it took bet, better part of a, a year plus to put those cameras at the beach. You proved it this year and it didn't get installed for next year. So um, I'm just saying maybe maybe be, be better just to have a little caution and maybe catch up on some of the projects that's gotta be done and have been put off for one, way, one thing or another. Uh, the CIP project, every time you get a new project and you ask Mr. Brown, how are we gonna pay for it? He says, CIP, $50 million in, 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 uh, in bonds for 20 years, where are we gonna get the money to pay for? CIP. No, that's not a fair statement. No. That's not a fair statement. No, I'm just, I'm, what, I'm, what I'm saying is we, maybe we ought to, you know, do like the parents. You know, you creative gotta, towns, innovative towns, towns that wanna stay with the flow, keep moving, do creative things. This is just the first step in something that could be creative, could, may not be accepted. Again, this is just the first step. Is it available? If we apply, would it be available? And then we can take the next steps down the road. You know, okay. we're already well, tying boats up on this dock tonight. Okay, we don't even know if we're <laughs> gonna get the money. Well, that was, that was the problem with the other one that- We got a harbor master gonna tie his boat up down there. <laughs> That was the problem with with the other back in 2011. People supposed to dock there and do. But that, that was a different anyway, story. Like the vice president I, I, said. I understand. It's not. A, it's not, it's not the same. It's we were going to rebuild dock. the whole yeah. ramp down there. Yeah. This isn't a fixed I, dock. I, I think sometimes this is a move, portable dock. We move too fast. Yeah, Thank but you. we have to think of safety too down in that area. Okay. Anybody else? Okay. Thank you. Okay. Motion to close the public hearing. Second. Motion to second to close. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, thank you. Number 11, again, authorizing submission for application of resolution of the council, authorizing submission of RIDEM grant for lights, concession, restrooms, and scoreboard for multi-use playing fields, former drive-in property, 1199 Aquinnick Avenue. Motion to pass said resolution. Second. A motion to second to pass. Any further conversation? Hearing none. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Item number 12. Resolution of the council. Authorizing submission of RIDEM grant for dock at Third Beach Boat Ramp. Motion to pass that resolution. Second. A motion to second to pass. Any further conversation? Hearing none. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Item number 13. Ordinance. An ordinance of the town of Middletown. This is the first reading. An ordinance and amendment to the town code of the town of Middletown. Title 13, Chapter 130, General Offenses, Repealing Section 130.02, Indecent Intoxication, See Attached Ordinance. Motion to receive said ordinance on its first reading. Second. Motion is second to receive on its first reading. Any conversation? Hearing none. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Town Administrator, Item Number 14. Memorandum of the Finance Director through the Town Administrator with enclosures, RE, RFP, CDBG, Administrative Services. Motion to receive said memorandum. Second. Motion to second to receive. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Mr. Brown. Uh, this is a recommendation to award a contract to Church Community Housing to provide administrative services as it relates to the CDBG program. Um, they have provided these services for as long as I've actually worked for the town. Uh, we received notification from the state that they wanted us to go out to bid. Um, they're doing that throughout the state and uh, we had one, one proposal which was from church community uh, and we're recommending that you award the contract for a total amount of $11,446. Okay. Item number 15. Resolution of the Council, award of the contract, CDBG, Administrative Services. Motion to pass said resolution. Second. Motion to second to pass. Any conversation? I just have one question, Sean. Sure. Okay. So that, that amount, it's, it's for three years though, right? Yes. I mean, it goes uh, up just a little bit each year. It's not just that one dollar amount. Correct. I, don't, I just want to make sure we're, we're, yep. we're clear on yep. that. Okay. Yes. Good point. Okay. 
Okay. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Item number 16. Memorandum of the town plan to through the town administrator with the closures. Local multi-hazard mitigation plan update. Motion to receive said memorandum. Second. A motion to second to receive. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Mr. Brown. Uh, yes, this is a request to the town council to approve our local multi-hazard mitigation plan. Uh, this was a process that was undertaken by a number of staff members uh, to update our, our hazard mitigation plan. Um, I have Rita from the planning office here to walk through uh, some of the highlights of, of what's included in the update. Um, we're here to answer your questions and then seek your uh, approval of the document. Please introduce yourself. Rita Lavoie, Principal Planner. I have a short presentation here. Thank you, Rita. Um, this explains the hazard mitigation plan and goes through some items that were new to this update and where we are with the status. Um, so quickly, hazard mitigation planning generally is intended to make communities more disaster resilient um, and it outlines specific actions to reduce the physical, social, economic hardships resulting from a disaster. The goals, more specifically, especially of this particular plan, is to protect, safeguard, and preserve the assets here in town. That includes lives, property, residents, visitors, businesses, critical infrastructure and facilities, and then the cultural, historical, and natural environment. The benefits of hazard mit mitigation plan are very wide ranging. Uh, reducing harm, saving lives being sort of the top of the list, but also protecting infrastructure, um, preventing damage, uh, increasing the response time, and improving uh, the safety of our first responders are uh, some of the top of the list as well. When the town started to embark on uh, this 2019 update, it formed a local hazard mitigation committee with members of the planning department, fire department, public works, police, engineering, building, and zoning. And uh, the local hazard mitigation committee met regularly. Um, they came up with a draft that was then presented July 24th at a public meeting. This was hosted by the planning department and included an advertisement in the Newport Daily News. Um, notices of the meeting were mailed to property owners in the Atlantic Beach District flood hazard area and notices were mailed to key stakeholder groups. Uh, feedback was received, amendments were made to the draft plan and then a final draft plan was posted for a 30 day comment period um, and that was posted from July 29th through August 31st with an ad in the Newport Daily News. <coughs> Um, after those comment periods, a submittal was uh, sent to the Rhode Island Emergency Management Authority and then after we received preliminary approval from them to the Federal Emergency Management Authority. And that's where we are now. We have um, a preliminary approval pending adoption by the Town Council. So to go specifically into our plan, this is sort of a summary of what the plan says in it. Um, the plan looks at uh, identifying hazards assessing vulnerabilities, and then choosing specific mitigation actions based on those two assessments. So I'm gonna start by describing some hazards. Some of the hazards that are profiled in the plan are listed here. Uh, they range from severe weather and flooding issues to drought to the more man-made issues such as hazardous materials and terrorist events. These are wide ranging and are uh, dictated by FEMA of what we should be profiling. Each profile goes into depth and explains what will be affected, who will be impacted, the estimated losses, and the critical facilities that are impacted. After the hazard assessment, we dive into the vulnerability assessment. The vulnerabilities are evaluated on a scale of hazard frequency and vulnerability scope. Those range from unlikely to ever occur, to may occur every 11 to 100 years, to one to every 10 years, to occurring very regularly. And the scope ranges from um, not affecting very much uh, in town to infecting the entire town very significantly. This is an example of some of the vulnerable areas that were identified in this process. Uh, they include group homes, propane facilities, areas where wildfire may be significant, areas of potential flooding, 
And this is the full list of all of the vulnerable areas ranked in priority order. These were identified by the Local Hazard Mitigation Committee and ranked as such. Um, starting with the uh, most significant being vulnerable populations and vulnerable di business districts and going down the list um, to vegetated wildlife areas being the lowest of the vulnerable areas. Finally, based on the hazards and the vulnerable areas, then mitigation actions were chosen. Uh, the mitigation actions were chosen to reduce risk, um, but they were evaluated using a, what's called the Staple E method, which looks at the Staple E stands for social, technical, administrative, political, legal, economic, and environmental impacts. So some of the questions that were being asked are, does the, uh, the proposed measure treat people fairly? Will it work? Is there capacity to implement and manage the program? Is there public support? Do we have authority to implement it? Is it cost beneficial? And are there any adverse impacts? In the end, uh, the general mitigation actions and procedures can be boiled down to these general categories. And then my last slide are the specific actions that are new. So the general categories are uh, to improve infrastructure and reduce hazards to incorporate hazard mitigation into town regulations, to increase public education and outreach, to manage uh, natural features to reduce hazards, and to provide support to vulnerable populations before hazard events. And then this last slide outlines the mitigation actions that are new in this 2019 update. And um, I'll, I'll leave it here for comment, but I, I won't go through each one of them. Thank you. Thank you. Councils have any questions? Council Flynn. Um, yes, thank you so much, um, Rita. So I have a, a series of questions, but overall, this, this is stamped draft right now. So once the council approves it, is it correct that it's actually going to become part of our comprehensive plan? Plan it will, you know, the watermark will go away and it will be part of the comprehensive plan. Uh, the, the final step is if the if the council adopts it, then there's a, a final submission to FEMA. The approval we have from FEMA right now <coughs> is a conditional approval pending adoption by the town council. So there could be amendments that could be made now, and then it would go back to FEMA. <coughs> okay, and and it becomes an appendix to the comprehensive plan. So when the comprehensive plan falls under review every ten years by state law. Would that also, that appendix, also be under review on that cycle? I'd like Ron to weigh in on Sorry. that process. So with our current comprehensive plan, that's what happened, is the um, hazard mitigation plan was attached as, as an addendum. And that was done, at least in part, because our plan, it's just getting into the weeds, but it, our plan, our current plan, was adopted and approved under a prior set of standards by statewide planning. When we redo our next um, comprehensive plan, there's going to be more stringent requirements, uh, particularly in, in, re in regard to hazard mitigation and climate change that will have to be incorporated into our next comprehensive plan. So I guess my answer to your question is it's yet to be seen whether we will then still have to append this plan to the next version of the comp plan. Okay. So it doesn't fall under that review. It won't be, re this appendix won't be reviewed the next time our comp plan is reviewed. That's a no. That's a maybe. Okay. <laughs> we're, we're at least five years out from the next comp plan. So I think, again, it just depends on, on where we are with the drafting of that next plan and whether this document needs to be appended or not, it's possible that it would be. Okay. Um, so I, I have some other questions that came in to me by email. I don't know if um, Ms. Lavoie would be better to ask them or not. There's sort of elements of the hazard plan. Um, and so one of them was, uh, were, were Navy, the Navy base or Navy ships ever looked at as a resource in you know, an evacuation or emergency situation? Is that part of anything that we are considering? I don't think that was discussed. Okay. Um, these are just things that kind of came through. And um, I know that, I, I think that the source that I got this from said that they did, they were a valuable resource in um, 
hur storms, uh, hurricanes, Florence, Irma, and Dorian. So I didn't know if that was something that we wanted to look at at some point in time. Sure. Okay. Uh, also, a concern that uh, in the past, the, the three bridges to the island have been closed due to high winds or earthquakes and um, traffic control in those situations where we have no bridges, is that addressed? Not, not in that specific term. There is talk of traffic control within the plan, but not, not in that context of having the bridges closed. Having no bridges, maybe something to consider down the line. I, I'm not sure exactly what to do with these. I thought since we're reviewing this, this is the time to do it. Sure. Well, I guess, you know, for the purposes of tonight's meeting, I, I guess if we're going to be talking about amending the draft, we would need some direction from the council because we, we, we need to, um, there's a resolution, the next item on the docket is a resolution to approve the plan. Um, so if the council wishes to make revisions or amendments to the draft, then that's action I think you would have to take tonight prior to or as part of that resolution. So or I, I get second option um, would be to continue the matter um, and have it come back for a, additional discussion. So I have these issues that have been sent to me since it was on the docket tonight. I, I think it may be worth forwarding them to you to see if they should be fit in somewhere I, to the council's you know wish or desires to make this best. Or is it something, I guess, to my first questions, that if we, because I know we can adjust or amend the comp plan periodically, is that still yeah. true? Oh, yeah. So if this is part of the comp plan, maybe we just do it as as amendment, or is that not true, because FEMA also has to approve it? Well, that that's a, yeah, that, a bit of a sticking, sticking point with this particular document, is, it, okay. is it's, it's gone to FEMA once, and it's been uh, approved preliminarily. Um, if we make revisions to it, that's fine, but we have to send it back up to FEMA for their additional review. Um, I guess if, you, if you've got some specific recommendations uh, and, and the council's agreeable, then we could review those with the committee, the, the staff committee that drafted the update, and then have the committee look at, at possible amendments and, and bring those back. Are we on a deadline with this document? Our current plan um, expires mid-January, so as long as we have a, a, a revised or a, an amended, updated plan adopted and approved by FEMA by that date, mid-January, we're in still, good, still in good shape. Um, the, the plan itself, the purpose of the plan is to make us eligible for pre-disaster mitigation funding and some other uh, federal programs. Um, we certainly would want to have our new plan adopted before the current plan expires. Uh, but if that doesn't happen, I don't know that it's the end of the world. We would be shortly thereafter getting it approved if, if we miss that, that mid-January timeframe. Well, I'd like to, you know, um, I would like to, if you think you can get the committee together, we have two more council meetings this year and then in January we'll be meeting. Um, I think, you know, the, I was at that meeting July 24th. It was myself and, you know, Carrie Lewis was there with many and, and she was actually the one that did this review. So I shout out to our, our neighbor who took the time to read this document since we just got it last Wednesday and had, you know, some, some questions to follow through. Um, I, I think it might be valuable to have the committee incorporate some and make that, that plan as best as it can be. So could I, so I guess before we start delaying the document, so we heard about Navy ships being used to evacuate and traffic control, specifically in this instance that bridges are closed, but what are the other major items? Oh, sure. Um, let me see. So I mean, I one of the questions was um, the, the uh, prioritizing of the shelters and uh, if the, uh, and prioritizing of of allocations of funds by the risk assessment model or the highest threat areas. I guess those are buzzwords in the document. Uh, mock training, if there's a schedule for mock training. Uh, let's see. Um, concern of adequate reinforcement of the seawall repair and, um, and amount. Uh, let's see. Guidelines on how many shelters per town. I guess there's no specific guidelines on how many shelters per town that the state mandates. It's up to the town. 
and they, the state wants a shelter with an AC and a generator, but not sure about specific requirements, and the uh, emergency shelter currently, I guess, from Middletown would shelter less than 10% of the population, and 3.6% of our population is between 65 and 76, so the bottom line question of all of that is, what are Middletown's current shelter capacities, and what are the future shelter goals? Uh, and I don't know if that's, that's all in there, but those were the questions, the critical ones that, that she had forwarded. Right. And are those things that should be in that plan, I guess is the question. I could certainly do that um, if we are going to be on a schedule to get this done by mid-January and incorporate what you deem should be incorporated. Ron. Yes. Now that you heard some of the comments by Councilor Flynn via her source, and knowing the window that we have here, what would you suggest be our preferred uh, course of action from tonight on. We only have two meetings in December, and I'll tell you, both of them are pretty loaded. So now I'm looking at January. I mean, this is like an 11th hour thing, both on you and on Councilor Flynn. Well, we did just get this on Wednesday. I understand. Okay. I guess the, the preference would be to get it approved and adopted so that we don't have a lag time uh, between our current plan expiring and potentially a new plan being adopted. We do have the opportunity to amend the, the plan after the fact, if necessary, Absolutely. to address some of these concerns and questions. So to keep things moving, maybe that's the better way to go, is to review these. Good point she brought up, but you know, this is the 11th hour. So let's get the plan through. We have a plan and we can, uh, we can tweak it later on. I think that's a good way to go. Okay. It can be amended after this date. Sure, I mean, we would it. still have, we would do what I just said. We have to go back through FEMA and everything, but at least we'd have an approved Correct. plan. Yes. It's in our hand. Okay. Item number 17, resolution of the council, local multi-hazard mitigation plan update. Motion to pass that resolution. Second. Motion and second to pass. All in favor? Aye. Aye. 18. Memorandum of the Town Administrator with enclosures. Request to install lights at Holland Park. Motion to receive said memorandum. Second. Motion and second to receive. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Mr. Brown. Uh, Mr. President, there's a group of uh, bike riders that uh, called Newport Bike Polo that are using the uh, uh, outdoor hockey rink. <coughs> I don't call it a hockey rink. The, uh, the, the rink at Holland Park. Uh, to play uh, bicycle polo. Uh, they've requested to install uh, temporary outdoor lighting at the uh, facility so that they can play bike polo through the winter. Um, and then along with this request, they're seeking the town to consider at some point in the future a, a capital improvement so that the court would remain lit um, throughout, you know, on, a, on a more permanent basis. What they're proposing right now are temporary LED lights uh, with a generator uh, down the road that the town would install uh, lights on a more permanent basis. Uh, I brought this to you for your consideration because it does change the nature of that park. Um, it is next to two residential homes. Um, and I believe, I think the representatives from the group here will, yeah, that, that would like to address you on the matter. Okay. Name and address, please. Tice Potinus, uh, 27 Garfield Street of Newport, Rhode Island. And? And we are requesting that we can, uh, requesting permission to install temporary uh, lighting as a proof of concept that uh, eventually maybe the town middle, uh, uh, town of, uh, the, the town will eventually take up our, our claim and put up a more permanent uh, lighting situation. Okay. Mr. Braun, do we have an estimated cost on this? Um, I don't at this time. Uh, so I, th I think initially for the temporary <coughs> lights, obviously the cost is on uh, to be borne by the, the bicycle polo group. Um, well, you just said we were later on going to put a right, I would need permanent 
structure up there. We, I thought we was Middletown. Yes, I, I would need to get a, a cost estimate for that. Okay. Um, How large is this group of people you have? Uh, we've got about 30 members on our club. Where do you play now? We, we play at Highland Park. And you want to just stay longer and play? We want to, well, it's, it, with daily savings, it's a little bit harder to, to play at all. Um, so yeah, we, we request just uh, the ability to install our own lights. Um, that could be taken down any time and of our own. When you say install your own lights, you're going to pay for the installation of these lights? We have uh, four floodlights that can be installed and di disinstalled uh, very easily. And we just uh, request permission to install them uh, just on a temporary basis. I'm not really sure how this would affect the neighbors in the area mm -hmm. with uh -huh, these floodlights. Uh, so uh, I don't know how it would affect them or even if we should entertain this request. Um, we, yeah. We've been in conversation with the neighbors that are around the park, and one of the things that they have expressed to us is that they enjoy using the park, and they have no problem with the lights that we have brought out and assembled and disassembled. Um, we just request that we can keep them up on a more temporary basis. Have you been using lights now? Uh, yes. We install them, and then we take them down, basically. Okay. We'd like to just keep them up for the winter time. So why wouldn't we want to keep that trend up? Why are you looking at the town to put more permanent lights up for you? Uh, we just want approval from the town to keep them up for like a temporary seasonal basis, um, just for the just for the winter time essentially. So how how, how long do you expect to be playing out there this winter? Uh, all winter long. Really? We, yes. We've been playing for two years now, and it's it's. Everything that we do is basically, you know, we, we play and we play once, once a week, sometimes twice a week. And uh, it's, yeah, we, it's, uh, it's been, it's, it's, it's like our, our club's thing is to play during the wintertime. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mr. President? Council uh, Santos, you're uh, right behind the Vice President. Go ahead. Sorry. And I'm going to maintain the baton on it. Vice President, you're Thank up. You. Thank you. So, if you go back to the councils of late 80s, early 90s, mm -hmm. when they established that park, mm -hmm. um, that park was established, and I believe it's in writing, as a passive park. It's evolving to more than that. It's not like, I know Sean's looking at me and listening very closely, and Mrs. Kelly, it's not like the sports complex we have over here at, at Gorday. This is a very small neighborhood. It was developed as a passive park. I'm afraid if we allow this, then we have another proposal that's going to be continued for something else over there as well. That's you that they're using then as well, uh, pickleball or, or pickle polo or pickle whatever. I don't know, but I, I think we need to be careful here. And I think, you know, you know, I think you're already using lights, which you probably shouldn't. I know you probably didn't know until someone probably they raised their hand and said, "Hey." You know, we need to go ask permission or somebody complained, I, I don't know. But I'm not going to support this. That, that's a passive park. That was for kids. Mm -hmm. It was a small basketball hoop. It was, th that rink wasn't even there until maybe 15, 10, 15 years ago. And they, it was just flat. And then Tom Welch and the Cub Scouts or Boy Scouts and closed it and did some work on it. Um, I don't see it being used a lot. I see it being used a lot. Uh, for little kids and families that go out there. Um, I'm a Middletowner, and you know, I, I'm not saying people from out of town can't use it, but that's what it seems to be developing. I grew up, I went to that school when it was a school, and I drive by there all the time, and I see a lot of Massachusetts license plates in there. So I think it's being used more than for just Middletowners, which is okay to a certain extent, but again, it's developed as a it's developing into more than just a passive park, what it was actually designed for. Hmm. So, Thank you. Council Santos. All right. I'd like to ask you some questions, if I may. Of this group, are you all Newporters? We are not all Newporters, no. We all have right. some Middle Town residents uh, with us tonight. Why haven't you found a park in Newport? Uh, because there, is, there are no parks that are like the one in uh, uh, Howland Park. This is a very unique place on the what island. What are your hours? 
That we play? Yes. We play from 6 p.m. to uh, 9.30 p.m. Okay. You have liability insurance in case somebody gets hurt. Or we, are you figuring the town's going to pay? No, we do not have the liability insurance. Mr. Brown, do they have to have liability insurance? Uh, no, it's a park. It's a park. So if anybody gets hurt, they can't come back and sue us. Um, I would defer to the solicitor. Mr. Uh, Mr. Solicitor, Peter, could you weigh in on that? Because if we're condoning an activity, even though it's it well, within our it's, park, it's, I think it, it's a little different. We do have the, the, the state recreational use statute, which as long as we're not charging people admission for the use of public parks and recreational facilities essentially um, leaves the town you know the only thing the town can't do is is if they know somebody's hurt is just leave them lying there so it, it essentially lowers the town's uh, duty to that that you would give to a trespasser it lowers on private it. property Peter yes. it lowers it yes. it doesn't eliminate it correct no it, 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 it is that a it, fair it, statement it doesn't eliminate it. If we if we condone the use of a public property for something like this, there is a liability issue. We, well, there's we always, just, there's always exactly. an issue because if someone gets hurt, the town always gets brought into it. But once again, uh, with regard to public recreational facilities, where you're not, as long as you're not charging someone admission, so it's different. For example, at the beach, where you're charging someone to come in. Um, uh, there is uh, more protection under state law. Council and body. I am not finished yet, sir. Oh, I'm sorry. Go right ahead. I, thank you. I have to agree with our vice chairman said that that at one time was a small park for the community, the er the residents around the area where they could bring the small children. The mothers would bring the the babies. They would sit and chat. Now it's grown into something much larger that. I would have, I'd be afraid to bring a child over there because of such activity that is going on there. That's all I have to say. You done? Yes, Thank I'm you. done. Thank sir. you, ma'am. I don't have that many questions. Council Body. So <clears throat> I'm going to agree with Paul and Mrs. Santos on the fact that the park is evolving. That park is unique in and of itself and where it is and it's it's in a neighborhood um, as opposed to you know, the Gaudet area, and maybe even Linden, which is off the West Main Road. Um, I'm really not in favor of expanding the use of that park. And, and I don't believe, it, whether it's pickleball, or whether it's bike polo, or they use it for street hockey, and the, uh, the you know, it's just getting to be more and more and more, and I don't think that was the intended use of that park, and I was yeah. not part of the council when that happened back in those days, but um, I think it's just not the right spot for it, particularly with lights and at night. You know, it, mm -hmm. it just doesn't, it doesn't fit. Um, there are other places, I, I mean, I guess maybe there aren't, I don't know, I don't know. But, and um, I'm not about, you know, go to Newport or go to Portsmouth or go somewhere else, but um, it's, a, it's a middle town, small park, and I want to keep it that way, so. That's, that's all. I just thank agree you. with my fellow Council Flynn. Um, thank you, Mr. President. I, I would like to have some of these sentiments mirrored towards Third Beach in the future conversation, but that's for another time. Um, so I, I'd like to support the sport. I, I think it's kind of cool. I think kids are looking at that and saying, wow, that's neat. I'd like to try that. Um, but I, I have some questions, concerns. Uh, your hours, I, I didn't know if the park itself had hours, if our public parks have hours, if they're sunset, sunset to, or sunrise <coughs> to sunset, or if they have posted hours, or if just whenever you want to go. Do, does anyone have an answer to that? Do our public parks have hours? We don't. We do not, so they're 24 seven. Okay, um, and 6, 6 p.m. to 9.30 p.m., I assume you have to start at six because people have to get off of work. Is are the games or games? Do they take that long? Like little league baseball <laughs> with the with the young ones, they they go that long till nine thirty. We usually play until like after we get off of work until about nine thirty is is the time that we usually stop. Okay, because if you've got young children in that neighborhood, that's pushing it for. And I don't know how much noise that makes. Um, uh, when I lived in Newport one of our backyard neighbors put up a skateboard ramp in their backyard one summer, and it was like Chinese water torture. 
um, because it was the skateboards on the ramp and they were well into the night. We were good neighbors, we tolerated it, but I, I can empathize with that. I'm not sure what kind of noise you guys generate. Um, if they don't mind the lights to date, apparently you can bring them in and take them down, that works. Um, but I wouldn't want to expose our residents to an annoyance. I, I think that that's critical. I, I think you've been very polite about how you're doing this, thank you. Um, but it does have to be long-term work for everybody. Um, and I did notice on the, the pickleball contingents package that we did get to review that um, they were, did not request lighting on purpose in, in deference to the neighbors. They actually did not request that. So it is sort of a, a sticky issue. Um, and so I'm, I, I think that you're probably good to go as you've been going. You may have to just put your lights up and take them down. Um, I don't know, is there any, if, if the town approved lights to go up and stay there or put in lights, would there be any additional liability? Because we're providing, a, you know, a space that, that can be used for activities after hours, and if one of those went out, you know, would we be liable for anything? Sorry. I apologize. I'm sorry. You're so the, next the, the question was, if we allowed lights to stay up off season, or we put lights up permanently, would any additional liability happen um, you know, because we're creating a, a, an area for activities at, at dark? And what if a light went out? Would, would, would there be any additional liability around that light I, issue? I, I don't think the lights itself. I think it's really the nature of the activities that you're allowing down there and, and uh, you know, that, that create the liability, not necessarily the lights or the lack of lights. And I think the lights, the lights frankly, are more of a issue with regard to the impact on the surrounding neighbors than, than a liability issue. Okay. Um, so, uh, so, so those were sort of the, the overall questions. And I, I, I just want to kind of throw something out that, you know, tonight we've had, uh, you know, bike polo here. We've had um, the pickleball here, and they're coming back. And we had uh, the uh, fitness courts proposal and solicitation that came in under consent. And I didn't know if the council had an appetite to, to think about in the future an indoor facility for activities or a collaboration with the Y to expand um, and allow all of these residents that want to do things like this, you know, off mainstream, a place to go. And also for our, you know, with Middletown Prevention Coalition in mind, to give our young people some place to go off season and later at night. So I, I just think that you know, we ought to put that in the back of our minds. I just wanted to put it on the table. Thank you. Council Santos. I have a question. You quoted, uh, I heard you say you've been there two years. That's correct. Did you get permission from anybody to go there or you just figured you could go ahead and play? We started playing, yeah, in the spring of 2007. Did and you request any um, permission from the town? Our administrator, our recreation director? Did you all just go just in and just started playing? Because we figured it was a public park, we decided to use it like a public park. Oh, just like that. Yeah. Okay. Mr. Brown, do they have to get permission? No. 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 All right. I don't it's think a public it, park. I don't think it's fair to the neighborhood kids or the <laughs> residents around there that. Um, someone can just take over the park and the other kids are left behind, the locals. Mr. Brown, have you had any complaints? I, I haven't had any complaints. Um, and I did, I, I did, I guess the one thing I did before tonight, and it's, it's something I've addressed with the, um, will address with the league, there, there, there are social media posts where Basically, alcohol is part of the events, which is something I need to address with the group. So that, you know, bringing alcohol into the public park is an issue, um, which I believe we can address. I, I think it's, I think this is probably more of a, an issue with just not understanding what the rules are than, than something malicious. But um, there is that, again, I think, and it's sort of what the council is talking about. It's a different activity coming into a park that's been historically been used by families. Right. Uh, again, it's something just observed, you know, I observed last night looking online at what the club does, so. 
Um, so that's not a complaint, but an observation. Well, are you guys doing that? I, doing what? You didn't hear him about alcohol? You uh, alcohol? Because obviously if somebody's posted it on social media. So we were sponsored by a, a beer company. We received money from a beer company to okay. help our club promote our sport. And, but no, we do not bring alcohol into the park. Okay. Okay. No. Has any council received any complaints from any neighbors? Council Santos? Yes, Council I got Toronto? to this afternoon. Um, I haven't received any complaints, but I know there's new construction going on over there. And honestly, I think that park has been neglected. I think we just recently put up a new fence over there. And I don't know, if I've seen it, I've been over there looking. There are playgrounds for the kids to play and stuff like that. but. That rink gets a lot of work, a lot of play. So I don't know, we probably as a town need to look into that a little bit over there to see all the, because there's a lot, of, a lot of time over there. I mean, you guys are there late night, you're there early morning. Yeah. So there's a lot of, a lot of activity in that park right now. Council Santos, you want to share any uh, complaints? No, they were private. All right, so we'll keep them that way. Okay, next course of uh, action. Motion to allow bike pole to install said lights at Holland Park. Do we have a second? Hearing that motion fails. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Item number 20, memorandum of the town administrator, senior center project windows and door replacement. Motion to receive said memorandum. Second. <coughs> Mr. President, I'm recusing. I have a business association with one of the principals. Okay. Please note that Councilor Flynn has recused herself from item number 20. Okay, we have a motion and a second to receive. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Mr. Brown, Mr. Viveris, I know you want to speak in regards to this. Uh, the Senior Center uh, and the town, uh, we've been working uh, for the past several years at replacing windows in the, the Senior Center uh, building. Uh, the current windows uh, are, are vinyl replacement windows. They are, are not structurally sound in the sense that they, um, they leak. Uh, they don't work well. And the reasoning for that is that um, if you look at the windows at the senior center, they're, they're incredibly large. Um, the vinyl windows themselves uh, probably shouldn't have been installed in the first place. Um, you actually need a, a window frame a window unit that's designed to uh, hold the weight of the window uh, itself, um, which is causing really, I think, the bulk of the issues. Uh, so we had gone out over the last several years looking for money from the CDGB program. Uh, we've secured roughly $85,000 in grant funding, and uh, we're at a point where we need to utilize that money uh, because it's uh, it does have an expiration date on the, on the grant proceeds. Uh, we've been working with the Newport Collaborative Architects, who we've worked with before, um, to look at putting together a bid package to replace the windows at the Senior Center. Uh, we have an estimated project cost of $306,000, uh, but we're, we're at a juncture right now that in order to complete the stru structural review, the bid package, and the bid specifications, uh, we would need to engage uh, Newport Collaborative Architects uh, to finish that work, which would cost the town roughly $31,000. And that's the recommendation that I bring forward to you tonight. Uh, we have expanded our original work slightly to include replacement of the five doors um, that are at the Senior Center. Uh, they take considerable effort to open and close. Um, we would look to, with the addition of the windows, look to replace those doors. It would be part of the bid specification. Uh, with doors that um, are appropriate for a senior center that, that our, our senior residents can open and close easily um, as well as provide energy efficiency at the building. So uh, that's, that's the purpose of this docket item. We're asking for your request at this point uh, to support the hiring of Newport uh, 
our uh, collaborative architects to assist us in preparing the bid package. And that is the cost of what again? Thirty-one thousand. Thirty-one thousand. So, and and that would also, besides those services, include uh, inspection services of the project uh, once we go out to bid. Uh, once the once we've awarded a contract and the work is is being completed. So, uh, this would be from the beginning to the end of the project. Okay, Council Lombardi. Sure. The doors. I'm going to make an assumption that they are handicap accessible doors. They're automatic doors also. Um, they're not. They, they would just have hardware. They wouldn't have the, the automatic hardware that would significantly increase the cost of the project. Do we have automatic doors there? No. No, we have the doors that you literally have to throw your hip into to get the panic bar to activate to get through. Like, is that, but we did this last Friday when we were leaving. It, it takes a considerable effort to get in and out of the doors. So. Uh, we would look for a, a, a door that, that has the proper hardware for someone who's older to open as well as the, the assist. But it, it wouldn't be the, uh, the push button doors, handicap doors. Why, why not? Why don't we use, why don't we do that? Don't you think it would be, I mean, Arlene, I'm, I'm just asking. I just think it would make so much, it would make sense to at least have one, one handicap accessible door. If not, I mean, you know, I know you got five, you said. Mm -hmm. Especially the one with the ramp. Yeah, I mean, do you think? That yeah. should be. We, we could add that to the bid, you know, and, and get a price for it. Just the ramp door absolutely does need that because when someone's trying to come in with the walker, they're trying to hold the door and because um, it's a very, very heavy door and get themselves in at the same time. There's people all around all the time, so we always assist people as much as we can, but the ramp door definitely would, need, would warrant that. The other doors um, just don't meet code either. They were there when the original renovation of the building was done in 1989. Um, so that's what we've lived with till now. I'd, I'd like to ask that we include in the bid the addition to a handicap automatic door where the ramp is. We can have that. Let's, yeah, let's just see how this goes from here. Councilor Veris, do you want to make some comments on this? Thank you, Mr. President, members of the council. I'm not opposed to this project, just trying to place it in the town financial picture. Therefore, I have several questions. Is this project in the capital improvement plan? Because I've checked and the only project I see for the senior center is on page 151 for kitchen equipment. Two, what is the priority of this project? Three, why is this $30,638 architectural inspection contract being voted on tonight with $306,382 for construction for a total of $33,000? $337,020. Four, is there a 20% match by the town for the $85,000 CDBG grant, which leaves 252000 of the total still needed? Five, I understand from Mr. Uh, Brown's memo that he will need to identify additional funding to complete this project continuing forward would no notify you when ready to, to award the contract. Why don't we wait to find out where the money will be coming from? Six, it is prudent, it, is it prudent to enter into a $30,638 contract for services now if funding for the project is unknown. This is not common practice in private industry, but I guess, as Council Von Villas once said, this is not private industry, this is government. Would you use this practice for your own personal life? Mr. Brown also stated, told the council, they should be expecting the school department will be asking for a significant amount of money for their phase one cycle as they look at their five-year cycle of their strategic plan, indicating that that would be in January. 
where are you going to get this kind of money from? You know they're coming to ask for a uh, substantial amount, plus we're looking at uh, $337,000. I mean, Mr. Brown also stated that uh, at the October 21st <coughs> meeting that told the council, has mentioned that m more money should be put into roads, which Council Rodriguez had previously suggested when the $5 million bond was discussed. I, I mean, I'm not against the, the, the project, but I think it would, would it, this is not, a, if this is not a mandated item, perhaps it should be deferred at least until you have all the figures and you have a mechanism for the money instead of doing this and then looking for the rest of the money. Therefore, I'm going to ask the council to reject this proposal. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Rivers. Vice President. Sean, where's the additional money coming from? I think we're, we're looking at a, a couple of, of sources. I, I don't have it totally identified. The worst case scenario, as I sit here right now, as I would suggest to the council, um, well, there's, we, we would probably look at the funding that's been set aside for the West Main Road, um, possibly as a funding source, since that's readily available. Um, I look at this as a, a, a health and safety item um, as I take care of a, a, a mom who's older, um, who is cold all the time. Uh, this, is, this is important to the people that visit the center. The current windows are not, are not they do not provide a warm environment. Uh, the current doors do not provide safe entry or exit from the building. Um, and there's an opportunity with the grant money that the planning department and Arlene have been able to secure where, you know, if I'm looking at it from the resident standpoint, I can make these repairs that I think are critical, which is why I brought it to your attention, um, you know, essentially for 60 cents on the dollar, which is, you know, I think if you were home and making decisions on making improvements to your own house, if you can get a 30, 35% discount, on fixing the doors and windows. It's something that you would look at twice. Uh, so uh, that's one area I would work with Mark to look at the other capital, the capital improvement program, um, just to look at where we are from a cash flow basis. Some projects has, has been discussed, some projects move faster than others. So from a timing perspective, there may be an opportunity to fund the project from there also. But it wouldn't come from operations, it would come from our capital program. And uh, again, looking at it from the standpoint that from, you know, we can save over 30% for the taxpayers with the, the federal grant money. Uh, it is an opportunity and it seems wasteful not to uh, strongly consider it. So, so can we just, can we, can we, can we just say how this evolved? So, because my understanding is, this is about the, I get the $31,000 mm -hmm. because of the structure, I get it. But that's because of, I think three years ago, when they first got CDBG money for the windows at the senior center, it wasn't at this cost. They didn't have enough money to, from the CBDG to put the windows in at the time. So they, they got, okay. I forget how much money they got from CDBG grant. They didn't have enough to do the windows. Reapplied again, got a second round of approval money from CDBG. In, in between that process, the, I don't know if it's state or federal. International. International window committee safety people, whoever is in charge of it says, you can't put your typical windows in anymore. Now you have to put hurricane force windows in, which structurally costs a lot more. And the windows, the price went through the roof and up a couple hundred thousand dollars. So me thinking like I think, which I think is logical most of the time, 
This building has been through four hurricanes. Hurricane 38, Hurricane of 54, which I wasn't around for either one of those two. I was around for 86, Hurricane Gloria, and Hurricane Bob in 91. So never had a problem with windows. So I, I get standards change, I get it. Um, but maybe if we do have a hurricane, that the building will go and the windows will be standing, these hurricane force windows. So I get the standard, I'm just annoyed by it, I guess. And that's why we're coming before saying, okay, it's not just because, you know, typically you know we're very prudent with our money. You've been here and been involved in that. It hasn't always agreed with, with every, everything, and that's fine. But that's how, it is, that's how it has evolved. It hasn't just been, okay, let's just go and put these windows in. This has been going on for three years. In the meantime, the, the standard changed where the price went up a couple hundred thousand dollars. And now we have to look at it structurally because these, this glass is much heavier. And the frames around those windows may not be able to, they may or may not be able to support it. We don't know. So that's why we have to get this engineer involved. And, and that's why they're asking for the $31,000 to start this process. And, and we'll, we'll find funding for it wherever Mr. Brown's pretty good. It's going to be capital. It can't be anything but capital, as far as I'm concerned. I wouldn't approve it if it wasn't anything else but capital. So that's, I just wanted to make sure I understood the full picture of it. Mr. President? That's how it's evolved. Council Santos. Mr. Brown? Oh, excuse me real quick. And the windows there, I only know because she's my sister, and I've seen it. They actually put rags in there to keep the draft out in the back rooms. That's how bad they are. So... I'm not just saying it, just if it wasn't needed, I don't think any of us would be up here trying to approve it. Council Santos. Mr. Brown, does our poli police, new police station and our new fire station have these kind of windows? Well, the police and fire station, um, I don't know what windows they have, but they are code compliant. I, I would. At the time. At the time. Whatever now code was in the place. 10 years ago. Right. So um, the windows in this yes. building. If, if they were replaced, if they're not an insert window, if the window itself, the entire window was replaced, they are hurricane compliant. That's the most recent window product. Um, there are a few where we were only able to do inserts. Those, those are not hurricane res resistant as required because it, it falls under an exception because you can't replace the entire unit. Now, do you have an approximate cost on that uh, handicap uh, addition to that uh, door? No. How long is that going to take to be installed? I think that is a very important thing for our seniors there. It would be part of the bid, the bid spec prepared by the architect and a part of the, award, uh, the bid award, so with the project. All right, Mr. Brown, here's my problem tonight. Safety issue, your lips to our ears, right? Mm -hmm. Safety issue for our, our seniors. Why tonight are we hearing this safety issue? Why, why have, if this has been a safety issue, if they've been sticking rags into windows to keep the cold out, why haven't we addressed this earlier? Why are we waiting to tonight to address this? I, I think the effort has been to try to secure the funding so that we can do it mostly with the CDBG funding. Um, the original project, again, sort of going back in the, the time machine, uh, was to focus on the back windows of the building where the problem was the worst. Um, as we've discussed this over time um, and reviewed it, uh, the scope of the project has continued to increase, you know, to get into the point of tonight of, you know, at least my recommendation, we do doors. We added a, a handicap door on it. Um, I think we're all trying to be um, careful in spending dollars during these times and, and trying to balance it out. Uh, and, uh, you know, we are at the point now where uh, to do it right, to, to implement the, the type of windows that we have to, um, we, we do need to get an architect in place, and uh, we simply can't get more money for the project. We, we need to come to the council and uh, ask for that variance between the uh, $86,000 that we did secure from, with grant money and the, the total project right. cost of well, the 300000 Here's my point. Over the years, and I've sponsored a lot of them, 
when we wanted to cover the, the walkway going into the senior home. We wanted to put a walking track around the senior, for, for our seniors. This to me is serious. Entry and exiting out of that building is serious. Director, you got a comment? I, I am. I, I just want to reiterate what Paul said. This hasn't been something the, the administration or I have ignored. We've been applying for this grant for over three years and the original application wasn't enough money. We applied the next year. So this is putting rags, I mean, you know, we do put them in the back, they're not in the front, but they do exist. And yes, um, that's the way we have lived. We mentioned it before when we were doing, um, writing up the grants and why, the, why we needed them. Mm -hmm. Uh, so it isn't something we've ignored. We've been applying for three years to get where we are. When we finally thought we had enough money, the codes changed. And then it's so out of sight now. It, it, the, when this number came in, we were all shocked. I'm not suggesting that you ignored it, okay? So mm -hmm. I hope you didn't take it that way, which apparently you did, but that wasn't why I sent it. I said it because these are important issues. Yes, they are. For a senior to gain entrance in and out of our senior center, to me, you know, I would rather not have seen a senior van and made sure that entrance was, was good, or a few other things that we could have done away with in town and other departments to take care of that. That's my point. It's just that I understand waiting for the grant, do it all at once, understand, mm -hmm. but I mean, some of this could have been taken care of and not, not hit us all at once tonight is my, my feeling on this. Um, this is a priority, and this is something that we should do, and we have to do. And I'll tell you what, over the years, we've pulled uh, money rabbits out of a lot of hats, and this is a project we should be pulling a money rabbit out of a hat for. Well, thank and you. Uh, Mr. Viveris, by the way, the school department, those are bonds, okay? Mm -hmm. That was a bond, you talked about the money. Mr. President. Council Toronto. Thank you. I, um, <clears throat> I think it's important too. I mean, it's uh, something that should have been taken care of. I mean, I've been up here for three years now and it, we, each year, CIP, CIP, CIP. What do you guys need? That's the question. What do you need? What do you need? I haven't seen this on the CIP in three years. So I, I appreciate you bringing it forward, but I'm just, I mean, that's $300,000. What isn't gonna get done? What did we approve that now is not gonna get done? Well, that's something we're gonna have to take a look at. I mean, okay. we take this CIP money, we just move it from one project to the other. I don't even know why we identify projects. <laughs> I know it's, you have to, I know that's part of the charter, but we plan this out, we plan a budget, we approve a budget, we move forward, and the next thing we know, we've seen projects pushed year after year, move over here, we take the money from there, we do this project, and. That sits out there approved, just waiting for us to come up with some more money so that maybe we can do it this year, maybe not. I mean, I just, I, I, I wouldn't run a business this way. I mean, I understand there's situations that pop up that you've got to address, but this is $300,000. This is a lot of money. And we're about to do, you know, I'm, so I'm just putting that out there. I mean, if it sounds like people are interested in making this happen, I think it should have been in the CIP three years ago. Should have taken care of it. Well, I know you're looking to get grant money, I'm, but it's not well, happening. We were hoping the, the state money and the federal money would take care of it so it wouldn't come out of the taxpayers. That's what we were trying mm. to accomplish for the and last week. That. We got blindsided with the change in the code. That's what escalated the dollar figure up so high. But this is the first things. I've heard of it. But small things. I've been here for three years. This is the first time I've heard of it. So comes in our docket right now and we're talking about doing this is three hundred thousand dollars i'm a little shocked that's all a little shocked but my point is this like the handicapped door and in the van i know that was left to the the money was the money was left it was allocated center. so but the handicapped door we're going to pay a contract of thirty one thousand dollars a structural design engineer which we need mm -hmm. a structural design mm -hmm. engineer but you know what at the end of the day what would it cost us to put a handicapped door on that ramp right now? I have no idea. You know, you have accessibility with your van, mm -hmm. you'd have accessibility with people with walkers. It'd be one place that they can come in and out of unassisted. 
unassisted. If they needed it, unassisted. Mm -hmm. Mr. Brown, I'd like you to look into that. Into what? <laughs> into the into the um, the oh. handicap door on the ramp, the back ramp. If we could install a handicap door there. I think you already directed me to make sure it's part of the the bid. Yeah, but I'm saying today, separate, if, separate from. You know, to look into that is something that we could do within a, a short amount of time. Okay. Outside of this bid. Yeah. Mr. President, I just want to say one more thing. I don't want people to think I'm, I'm not wanting to take care of the senior center. You know that is far from the truth. We're going to do a lot of renovations over there, hopefully, at some point. But I think this is something we've got to address because it's definitely a health issue. And so. I'm not sure what's not going to get done. I guess Sean's going to tell us what we're not going to get done. I think we put 1.2 million towards the beach, but I think that can't be used, right? Restricted. It's restricted, but okay. Go ahead. No, I'm good. No, good. Okay. Item number 21: Resolution of the Council of the Contract Architectural and Structural Engineering Services. For the senior center window replacement project. Motion to pass that resolution. Second. You have a motion to second to pass. Any further conversation? Yeah, I, I, yes, Jim. Yes. Yes. Council Von Villas. Yeah. Probably for the first time, I agree with Mr. Toronto. <laughs> <laughs> hey, write that down, Karen. You got that? <laughs> I do. <laughs> I, I am very concerned not about the not about the, the grant money. I'm I'm concerned about all of a sudden in December we're talking about committing three hundred thousand dollars when we don't know where the money's coming from. Mm -hmm. That concerns me. I mean if we're if we were to put that and I certainly think the project is great, I have no problem with the project. If we were to we're always asked what should be put in the CIP. Well, this looks to me like this should be put in the CIP, not this should be taken from other things that have already been allocated in the, in the CIP. So, so I do have concerns about that. Um, I, I would like to know where the $300,000 would be coming from exactly. Not, oh, well, we'll find it somewhere. But where exactly would it be coming from? Because quite frankly, I support what's in the CIP right now. Maybe going forward another 300,000 for this particular project is great. I don't have a problem with that. But please don't tell me you're gonna take $300,000 from something that we've already committed to down the line and, and use it in a different place in December. Well, so that's what we're talking about. December. Mm -hmm. I agree, Mr. Brown. I got you. The vote tonight is to hire the architect so mm -hmm. that we can develop a scope, a bid package that will go out to bid. I'll come back with the price. We'll identify the funding for the project. The reason that this dis decis uh, discussion is accelerated is again. The $86,000 of grant money secured, again, an effort between Arlene, the planning department, my office, to try to get this down to a project that didn't cost the taxpayers money. It, it is going to expire in the, in the next six months, so we have to start working on it. So it's not a, not a $300,000 project. It's a $200,000 project. It's still a big number, but we, we are, again, the goal has been to manage the cost the entire time. There are times when this has been in the CIP under different titles where we've struggled with um, air conditioning and windows and doors. Again, uh, to, at that $100,000 price, which again, with the change in code, has made this much more expensive. When you put the, uh, the it's not just the window that you've got to change, you've got to, you've got to make building improvements so the window stays attached to the building. Mm -hmm. That's what's driving the cost. Um, I, I, I hear what everybody's saying. I, I think it's, it's manageable, though. 
Um, and that's that's. But what in I the like interim, to you're going to find out the cost of that that ramp door. As you point at me, yes, I am, sir. Okay, <laughs> okay, because that's important. <laughs> no, I I'd agree. like to get one door, that and that's the door. Would you agree, Director? That's that the, our seniors can come up to, unassisted, and gain entry into our senior center, and I think it's very important. So we'll get that. Um, no questions from the audience. Sorry. Okay. Go ahead. So, Sean, even if um, even if you find the funding for it, which I'm sure you will, um, and once you identify it, what what is the time frame for this project? The reason I ask because if it's, this isn't something that's going to happen till the spring, anyway, maybe it could be put in the budget. For the mm -hmm. Which it should be. Let's get that door fixed. So for the, the purposes of tonight's action, you still need to, we still need someone to come up with no, the bid spec I, and I price. get it, but I'm just saying when, when, would the, when would the project happen if you still have to go out to bid and all that stuff? So you're probably talking three, four months out anyway, right? Um, yeah, I would say three, four months to order the windows. But you would also want those, I think, to go in during the spring before the air conditioning and all of that starts happening okay. at the senior center. I mean, ideally, um, yeah, we would still want to, we would want to do this work during the cooler weather before you basically button the building up for, for the summer. Okay, so then it could be put in, in the 2021. Well, that would push it out, you know, out to, to, the, to the summer or fall. It, okay. it would push the project, I mean, it, it pushes the project. Okay. So, but I mean, it's not like I get it. I'm going to say air conditioning is still going out while the cold air is coming in. So, mm -hmm. either or. So, I was just trying to put the timing of it together to see if it could make more sense from a budgeting perspective. I, I think you're going to have, I, I think you're going to wrestle with this decision the same way now or, or in the near future as you would during the budget process. Um, there are going to be a, a, a lot of different ideas or, or requests or, or con, you know, different monetary things that come in the building, you know, and um, I, don't, I don't think it's going to make a real difference in your decision making. That, that's just my observation okay. from sitting here and knowing the group of people that, that's here. Um, I, I think it's something, again, we, we approve this tonight. If you know, and before, uh, we, we can look at the bid spec before it goes out, if the council is more comfortable with that, to see what what the bid spec looks like and what the architect's cost estimate is. Um, you know, and you, you can make the decision at that point in time. The one thing I do need to do, though, so back to the timing, um, it is going to expire. We're basically requesting that they, they defer the expiration of the, the money out to June of 2020. So that, that is the one piece, I guess, that okay. wouldn't fit in with the budget cycle is I would have to ask for a date that's even further out. Yeah, from that's down the road. Yeah, so I... You mean yeah, the 85, you have 85 or 86,000 has already been secured? It's secured right now, but it will, it does have a, a termination date. So we want to be in a position where we're saying um, we're going to use that money. And if anything, I'd want to be in a, even a better position to say if there's any money that is also being terminated, I'm shovel ready to take whatever leftover money there is. Because there has been years where CDBG has had leftover monies where, they, you know, where they're giving it away to whoever can spend it right away. So that, that's another opportunity that's out there. So, so when is C, I can't remember, I've done it probably 15 times by every, every year, but CDG, CBDG money is awarded when? It's, it's awarded annually, so we just got an award. What, uh, what is it, in the fall? The fall. Okay, I was going to say, because maybe we can apply for more money towards maybe more handicap accessible doors in the next year or whatever the need yep. is. You know, mm -hmm. so. All right, Council Santos, you want to make another comment? Yes, please. Right the resolution, it states engineering services for senior center window replacement. What are you going to do about the door? Is that a separate... Mr. Brown is looking into the door. But should that be part of this resolution? I think it's been clearly 
No, we'll get, I, I, we'll get that. My, my responsibility there is like clearly understood. He's going to do it. He said he's going to do it. He said he was going to do it. Okay. All right. Okay, we have a motion to pass that resolution. It's been seconded. Any further conversation? Hearing that. All in favor? Aye. 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 Item number 22. Communication of the finance director and the tax assessor with enclosures, collector abatements, collection of taxes for certain Middletown residents. Motion to receive said communication. Second. Motion to second to receive. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Mr. Brown, any comments on any of this? No? No, it's uh, mostly okay, routine. Just go right through. Administrative. Okay. 23, resolution of the council. Collector, abatements, collection of taxes for certain Middletown residents. Motion to pass the resolution. Second. Motion to second to pass. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Item number 24, communication of the finance director and tax assessor with enclosures. Collector, abatements, cancellation of taxes for certain Middletown residents. Motion to receive said communication. Second. Motion to second to receive. All in favor? Aye. 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 Item number 25, resolution of the council, collector abatements, cancellation of taxes for certain Middletown residents. Motion to pass said resolution. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Item number 26, communication of tax assessor with enclosures, cancellation of taxes for certain Middletown residents. Motion to receive said communication. Second. Motion to second to receive. All in favor? Aye. 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 Item number 27. Resolution of the council, cancellation of taxes for certain Middletown residents. Motion to pass that resolution. Second. Motion to second to pass. Resolution, all in favor? Aye. Okay, item number 28, memorandum of the finance director through town administrator with enclosures, beach operations, financial report, 12 months ended, September 30, 2019. Motion to receive said memorandum. Second. Motion to second to receive, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Mark. Good evening, Mr. President, members of the council. Tonight I'm here to report on the operations for the 12 months ended September 30th, 2019, 18, and two years prior to that. These are unaudited figures. Uh, the total for the operations, the total revenue that exceeded expenditures is $1,016,000. That is broken out at the following, and it's all, all of the following, the revenue did exceed expenditures. So for the beach operations, the t uh, it was $269,000. Harbor Master had a $3,000 revenue surplus. Campground, there was a total of $184,000. And in the capital replenishment fund is the $560,000 revenue. So in the capital replenishment fund, the total revenue generated since its inception of July 1, 2016 was a million four hundred fifty nine thousand dollars. If you go to the second page of the memo, which is the, the financial statements, page one of three, it identifies all the accounts that make up these numbers. The top portion is the revenue. And in 2019, the revenue for the beach was a million three hundred and seventy three thousand dollars, which was an increase of forty four thousand dollars over the prior year. In 2019, there was an appropriation from the Rescue Wagon Fund to fund boat upgrades for the Harbor Master. That was the $26,113, the first number. Your campground revenue was $229,000, which was an increase of $1,000. Part of that, um, had during the year, you did increase the fees, so there was a switch uh, from the seasonal campers we were unable to fill some of those uh, um, sites that the seasonal campers did not come back, but it was filled with the monthly and daily uh, campers. And the Harbor Master revenue was 33,000, which was an increase of $7,000. Uh, after that is your expenditures. You have your beach operations first. If you, con it continues on the second page, which includes the beach operations, the lifeguard, and the security, you had a total expenditures of a million three hundred thousand. Next is the harbor master operations of fifty six thousand expenditures and the campground expenditures of forty five thousand. 
for a total expenditure for the season of $1,400,000 for the net income of $1,016,000 as identified in the memo. Page three of the financials is, has it broken down as to each function as the revenue which was exactly as identified at the beginning. Any questions? I have some questions. I'm disappointed with the net beach um, that went to the bank compared to some of the other departments. Um, when I saw these, I had, a, I had a look at them a couple of times to make sure I wasn't making a mistake, and hopefully I'm, I'm not. Hopefully I am, I guess. Um, when I looked at the beach, um, when I looked at the beach uh, revenues, and it's on page one of three, when you look at it, and that includes the restricted income from the capital improvement, the 560, 560,500 you referred to, and that's the extra five dollars we charge that went to to capitals hopefully to either replace the parking lot at some point in time and or whatever capital uh, some council will decide um, and you said that since 2016 is inception uh, is one thousand one million four hundred fifty nine thousand dollars so far yes sitting there for capital for the beach right correct okay so when I look at <clears throat> The total um, net of one thousand sixteen one million sixteen thousand mm -hmm. dollars, and then I minus that five sixty off of there, yep. you end up with the four hundred fifty six, which is four hundred fifty six thousand, which referred to three thousand from the harbor mass to one hundred eighty four thousand from the campground, um, and two sixty nine from the beach. So I look at this and I go two sixty nine from the beach. 184 from the campground. Um, and then you look at, but when I really look at, Mark, the total revenue from the beach on page one of three under revenue for 2019, I see $2,433,066. Mm -hmm. So you're telling me out of that $2,400,000, $433,066, we took home $269,000? From the beach part of it, uh, that this, the two hundred sixty-nine does not include the capital replenishment. I, I understand okay. that. So that is correct. Okay. So, so, um, so when I looked at that, it just struck me as odd. And then when I looked at the expenses, and I specifically looked at the the, the payroll, just regular salaries. In 2000, that beach subcommittee recommended we went from 105 employees to 75 employees, right? So in 2018, regular salaries were 378,897, but in 2019, they went up $100,000. How could that be if we went down in employees? So there's a few factors. Okay. Uh, one that we, during the year, we had to increase the pay, grade, the pay rates based on what the state increase was. The state increased all of the payroll um, for their employees. And where, where does that show that line item here? That, that would be included in the salaries. But what was it? As a rate, it, it was all different depending on what position So what's the had. number? Was it 30,000 well, we went up for the year? Was it 40? It wasn't 100,000. It wasn't 100. That's one of the factors. I, and I think we can come back. I mean, this question of payroll came up tonight just before the meeting. So we can come back with a breakdown of the change in payroll from year to year. I think that's the best way. We're going to really drill down on those numbers. I think we should just have so, the opportunity to prepare to answer okay. your questions. Okay. So fair enough. So I just want to throw one question out there is that are we at, how many employees do we have? Is it 75 or is it not 75? So um, I ran a report prior to the council president asked me that question. So. I went back to the office and we looked at, during the whole season, there was 105 employees, but a lot of those were not, were, um, not full time. So the number of employees is, it well, should be based on hours. Most of the employees aren't full time. Oh, we're not full time, they're, correct. They're not, they've never been full time, but the majority of them. It's a part time job. The whole, 
the whole the whole staff uh -huh. is a part time job. I get the full time for the forty hours lifeguard or whatever. I get that part of it, but I don't understand how we with a council approved seventy five and we're at one hundred five. Well, yeah, I would say you'd have to look at how many hours. I mean, if you, if you say seventy five, is that forty hours a week? I mean. Well, then, if we're hiring people, we need to look at their flexibility and when they're available right. to work. That yeah. seems to be pro probably part of the problem. So when the council approves something, if you're going to make an amendment to it, usually it has to come back. What do you, what do you, what's your criteria for full-time? How many hours? It's 40 hours a week. It would be 40 hours. It is 40. So just looking at the data, so while Mark was looking at the numbers, I looked at the payroll from June 29th. 2016 to Ju uh, July 12th, 2019, 4th of July weekend. So at that point in time, we had 94 employees working. 58 of those didn't work 80 hours. Um, if we look at the number of hours worked during that pay period, so if we use the, the benchmark of 75, which would be 6,000 hours for the pay period, uh, we actually worked 6,470 hours, uh, 200 and... 95 of those were uh, people working overtime uh, for the for the employees that did work 80 hours. So, uh, and that that's the holiday weekend. So, you know, I I think again we, we were given you know five ten minutes to look at this after the executive session. Um, the goal the goal was done to stick to that that idea that there's 75 full time employees at the beach. Um, I know it's the council's desire that we find employees that will work the 40 hours, uh, but even with the aggressive recruitment drive last year, um, and I'm using that, that 4th of July week, um, only you know less than whatever, 98 minus uh, 90 minus 60, 30, 30 employees actually you know, worked that, that full 80 hours over that two week period. Uh, and that's, that's, that's you know, that's where we end up having to have additional employees, not full-time employees, down at the beach uh, in order to make the schedule work. I know that in, in my job at certain times of the year that, you know, it's, it's, it's your Christmas, so to speak, where you're going to make your money in seasonality. So I think maybe a suggestion would be when we hire people, there's a blackout period here that nobody can be off because I'm sure people are taking off. Mm -hmm. And if that's what you're going to do, then we'll find somebody else if we can, because it seems like it's driving up overtime and our, our um, execution is going down. Yep, so we don't, we don't actually pay overtime at the beach over, eight, over the 80 hours? You I just said X amount of dollars in overtime. I, oh, hours over, hours. hours over. Okay. So, but the rate of pay, to, isn't, there's not an over, overtime rate. So why of are they working extra hours? Because other people aren't coming or they're taking off? Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. So, but I would say this, just this, and I'm not being, I guess I'm being a little bit critical because I'm upset about this. When you put the report, I know you got to dig into it, I get it. And you see a payroll up $100,000 over last year, the light's got to go off and go, somebody's going to ask this question. Maybe I should have an answer. I, I don't know. I'm just well, I'm sorry for some my... Of, some of my other items where we, we were understaffed the prior year, and we did have a lot supervisor this past year. That well, we did understaffed the prior, the prior year? Maybe you were at the 75 the council approved. So what did we buy? Small equipment purchase, 14000 13000 any idea? I'm sure we probably it's, had to approve it, but it's, it's not coming to my memory. For the beach ops, I'm sure it was a lot of uh, different, I lot of different items. It wasn't just one, but I, I can check. I mean, it's a I pretty good increase. Um, so, like lifeguard salaries, right? So the rate goes up, but yeah. it only only went up twenty eight hundred dollars for forty people. So I don't know whether that other hundred thousand went up so much. I mean, I just mm -hmm. if there's forty lifeguards and there's thirty five or forty beach employees. We're missing something here. Um, I understand why the police went up a little bit and their overtime went up the last couple of years because we asked for more police right. down there. I get right. that part of it. Um, and so I guess that, uh, that pretty much... Uh, Mr. President? I, just, I was looking for more. I, you. I think if we're doing that much <clears throat> in, in revenue, we really need to take a look at our expenses. We really... 
I mean, with the revenues being generated, it's not like it's not. And I get that 560,000 of it is for capital, capital, capital. And I think that's the right direction because if we have to replace a building or we have to replace the parking lot, we don't have to go off a bond. Right. I, I think that's great that we've done that in the past. However, even still, I mean, there's, our, our, if you look at our profit margin, our sales are going up, so to speak, right? But our profit margin's going down by from 2016 before, maybe we should have just left it the way it was. We were at a 32% profit margin then. We went down to 25% in 2017. Um, in 2018, we're at 24, and in 2019, we're at 19%. We're doing more money, but less profit. I mean, that's something we need to look at. Council Santos. On the beach operations, um, so let's start off with town DC plan. I've been trying to rack my brain. What is DC plan? It's a direct contribution. So that's uh, from the state. Okay. State. What's the percentage of uh, FIC? Uh, the town DC is a, is is a four hundred one a. I'm sorry. The the five two 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 zero is a pension plan with the town. The one above it, pension MERS DC, is with the state. No, they no, the uh, town DC town. plan. What, yep, what's that's the four hundred one a. That's the pension plan. That's the pension. With new new employees. So they're not are lifeguards and part time people. They're not that the seasonal help. They're, the, the, they're help. not the seasonal help that go into that line item. So who is under this DC plan? Some of the some of your full time employees are budgeted in here, which is also allocated. Who are the we have allocations. Who are the full time employees down at the beach? Uh, we can get you the allocation you sheet. It's in your budget book also, but okay. we'll get you the allocation sheet. FICA. What's the percentage taken out of uh, wages now? Six point two. Six point two. Okay. And Medicare is 1.45. Okay, Medicare. All right. All right, that's all I have. Is, is it fair to say that some of our, or a majority of, or maybe not a majority of, our part time people down there end up working 40 or more hours? Yeah. That's a yes, fair statement. You can say, I don't know the percentage, but there's definitely yeah. some, yes. And when we had the Monday nights at the beach, we also had some people stay. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks, Mark. I did Anybody like the format can? of the report, though. Thank you. It was very easy to Thank follow, you. and I really like the profit percent because I got my eye on that. Great. Thank you. We had a, a tick up in sewer, too, this year down here at disposal, right? I noticed that. Yes, that's based on the water usage. Yeah. Yes, we use a lot with those yeah. extra showers. Huh? And we even put a meter in there to minimize yeah. uh, so it doesn't hit the showers. Yeah, I did notice that. It's a big tick up. Okay, thanks, Mark. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay, item number 29, boards and committees. Appointment of two members to the board, Newport and Bristol County Convention and Visitors Bureau. Terms expiring. September 2022. Motion to reappoint Robert R. Kempenar II and Thomas R. McGrath to the Newport and Bristol County Convention and Visitors Bureau. Terms expiring September 2022. Second. Motion second. Any conversation? Hearing none. All in favor? Aye. 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 Item number 30, appointment of one member to the Senior Citizens Board of Directors. Term expiring January 2020. Or term expiring 2023. Motion to appoint Jeannie Matthews to the Senior Citizens Board of Directors for a term expiring January 2023. Second. Yeah, motion to second. Any further conversation? Hearing none. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. Thank Aye. you, ladies Aye. and gentlemen. Aye.